Okay. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. This is our second go round of nonprofit uh, budget it's our, presentation. It's our third. 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 Yep. Wow. This is this is the final. This uh, is the final one. Yep. Okay. And so anytime, so anytime the board wants, um, each board member, you have the big nonprofit spreadsheet in front of you, and I can pull it up on the screen too if you need. Okay. Um, there is one addition that it was not on your agenda. Um, Central Virginia Small Business Development Center. You can see on the screen we've added them to the end. That one we just it, it just missed when we were scheduling things, so they're, they'll be on the agenda as well. Mm -hmm. um, and there's one that may or may not attend potentially due to not feeling well but um uh but again like I said certainly happy to go through everyone okay do we have quite a few online uh, yeah three online three online yeah all right so we will start with region 10 <clears throat> and when you come if you're here region 10 you see anyone region 10 I, i'm on i'm on okay, Zoom thank from region you. 10 right. yes all right. Um, Shannon Wright of Region 10. Yes. 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 Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. You may, you can begin. Thank you so much. Thank and, you so much for. You have, excuse me a minute, Shannon. There's five minutes. You have five minutes. Yes, ma'am. And I don't know, can they hear the little ding, ding, ding? Um, <laughs> but anyway, if, if I have to, if you're going oh, yeah. really over, I may kind of cut in don't mean to be rude oh okay. not at all and I, I, all I right. tried tried to keep my remarks brief knowing that you all have a busy agenda so thank, thank you so much for having having us having me my name is Shannon Wright I'm the senior director of uh, rural and developmental services for region 10 um, Aisha Williams Cassano who is the director of the Fluvanna clinic was very sorry not to be able to present to you this evening her, her a schedule conflict made that impossible, um, but she would have liked to have been her, here herself. Um, so I'll tell you um, and it's some information in addition to what you have in your packet. Um, some is is there and, and some additional pieces about the Fuvana Clinic and Services specifically. Um, uh, Region 10 for last fiscal year served a total of uh, 6,970, uh, excuse me, 6,097 people, 622 of them in Fluvanna County, and in all of our localities, we're on pace this fiscal year to serve more individuals than we served last year, so we won't know the totals of unduplicated folks until, until the end of the year, but that's in, in all our localities. We're seeing a lot of growth. Um, so right now, uh, the Fluvanna uh, uh, Clinic has nine full-time employees. Uh, three of them are providing case management to um, children or and or adults. Uh, one is providing services to um, children and adults with intellectual or developmental disabilities. We have three full-time um, outpatient clinicians doing um, therapy, um, mostly individual and some group with um, children and adults. Uh, one of those clinicians is um, is serving one day a week in the high school to provide outpatient uh, to students at the high school on site um, to, a, to address the, the need there. We also have a full-time peer support staff who does not work exclusively with the drug treatment court, but um, that's a big focus of his, that's a new position for us, and, and he's an, a newer staff, but really uh, taking to that job and, and uh, working closely with the folks, the participants in drug treatment court. Um, we also have our director, Aisha, and an office manager. That makes the nine. We do have four uh, vacant positions in, in Fluvanna. Um, Fluvanna, like the rest of our localities, is we're, we're struggling with workforce, with, with staffing. It's a challenge across, um, across the state at the CSBs, but um, certainly for us at Region 10. So we have um, 
one vacant clinician, one uh, IDDD case manager. And then we, we were really excited to get a grant last year through the state to provide school-based um, counseling services to the middle and high school. And, and we got that grant um, fully funded, but we have been unable to fill even one of the jobs. So we've had those two jobs open for recruitment since April. And in all that time, only had one candidate who ended up rescinding her application. So we're really anxious to get those filled because we're looking forward to that partnership with the school and understanding the level of need at all of our schools is quite high around um, mental health. Um, I think that that's just sort of gives you the the looking at the time. I'm about think of at three and a half minutes or so. Um, so that gives you the sort of picture of what's happening specifically in Fluvanna. Let me um, pause there and see if anyone has any questions before my, my five minutes is up. All right, any questions for Regent Tan or Ms. Wright? Anyone? No. No, no. no questions okay. right now. You can okay. continue if you have something, if you'd like to continue. Oh, I did. I thank you for that because I'm glad I had a few more minutes because I should report. So lots of excitement in the... Um, among our stakeholders and in the um, with our staff around the drug treatment court. So to report that um, that that kind of got because of the pandemic, sort of a slow start um, back in the spring of 2020, but now is is fully rolling ahead. We've had three um, participants successfully graduate from drug treatment court this fiscal year. Um, we have nine um, uh, additional individuals who are um, currently. Uh, you know, in good standing and, and participants in, in drug treatment court. So that's that's a really exciting development for for us. And we work um, not just our clinician in at the Fluvanna Clinic working with those individuals, but that we also partner with our uh, Charlottesville patient team who provides some of the groups that are required for um, successful completion from that program. So that's been a, that's been an exciting development um, for us with with uh, Fluvanna County stakeholders. That's All right. And I wanted to okay. speak to. Thank you. thank you so much. We thank you for all that you all do here in Fluvanna County. Um, I know you do lots of things for our citizens, and we, we certainly appreciate it. And I hope you'll be able to find that, those two positions for the school system because they're greatly needed. I could not agree more. So yeah, we're, we're struggling to hire clinicians really around, our, like I said, our whole agency. So we, we've, we're we really at, at the leadership level, really working on any and all strategies to recruit and retain clinicians because yeah, specifically the school-based opportunity is so needed. So thank you yes. for that. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to present. Okay, you have a good evening. You do the same, thank you. Our next presenter is ready. It's and, and one thing I was just going to yes. just note for the board here too. Let me just pull this up, and I apologize for not pulling this up before. Um, so let me see here, Region Ten. So uh, they are asking for yeah. uh, level funding one thirty one seven ninety four, and that's the funding that they received last fiscal year. Okay, thank you for that. Ready kids, they have ready kit online or. Anyone in the audience for ready kids? No. 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 Corey, did you get any? Any? You did? Okay. Well, we'll move on to Java Jefferson Area Board for Aging. Can, 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 mm -hmm. yes. Just real quick. Sorry. Does anybody know anything about ready kids? Yes. Uh -huh. So what is it? Um, they're right. Um, they're right there next to the... Uh, <clears throat> the old um, Martha Jefferson. They do a lot of things with kids and and parents, um, mental health. Uh, it, it's a lot similar to um, Chip, but they do a lot of things. Um, parents come in, training, and etc. And then that's uh, a real good description here. Yep. Early childhood education. Uh, they bring children in. They. They do a lot of things with parenting, and, and it's based in Charlottesville. I, they probably still work with um, children's health, too. So I, I had read about them, mm -hmm. and you said exactly what I was trying to figure out is, so between them and Chip. Mm -hmm. Chip goes into the home more. They go 
to the house, serve the children and the parents and things in the in, right in their place where they live. I don't think ready kids. I'm sorry, Marta. That's okay. <laughs> I don't think oh, sorry. No, no, that's all right. I think ready kids yeah. does more with kids yeah. in preschool and preschool. school. And I mm -hmm. think Chip does more with like truly, truly infants different. and right from birth from birth to six years. Obviously, the opposite end of what we do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. All right. Grandpa welcome. Said twice a <laughs> okay. Well, welcome. Thank you. Um, yes, I've got a yeah, PowerPoint. Just let me know when you want me to go to the next slide. Oh, okay. Excellent. So, um, thank you. I'm Marta Kane. I'm the CEO for Jefferson Area Board for Aging, and. Um, been thrilled for 10 years to come before you and talk a little bit about what we do. Um, Fluvanna, by the numbers, I wanted to let you know just a little bit about your population. Um, almost 20% of Fluvanna is over 65. And by the year 2030, 25% will be over 65. At least that's what the Weldon Cooper projections are. Of those seniors, 21% live alone. And that's significant only because they're probably more likely to have isolation and need for um, some support somewhere. And 35% are disabled. Um, the last few years, we've seen a nice increase in our services, um, 1,400 people in 2020, even obviously we kind of went right before the pandemic because that made it a little harder to measure. In 23, we've seen 1,590 eight, and now um, we're projecting an 8% increase to 1723. Next slide. Um, I wanted to give you a little sense of the services that we deliver down here at Fluvanna. The senior helpline, we've gotten a 99% satisfaction. And that is basically at the end of the call, we ask, have we helped you? And the reason I think it's so high is because if they say, no, like I didn't get what I wanted and we keep working with them. So we pretty much keep going till we get that 100%. Um, but that's our triage, that's that front line. They try and figure out what other um, agencies to refer to, what programs within Java to refer to. Our aging services coordinator, we're really thrilled. Stacia came on board about eight months ago now and she's been working really closely with Faith um, and so she's 30 hours a week at Fluvanna. Um, we used to have a 20 hour a week position and we just went ahead and upped it, it to 30 without making any requests in our budget because we felt that there's a need in this county. Community centers, um, Faith runs them. We deliver the congregate meals. The meals have gotten 100% um, satisfaction, which is always amazing when you can get to that. But um, I think it's partially because it's coming from, some of it's coming from the restaurant in town. Home delivered meals is a really important piece for those that are homebound. And so those are through, um, we either pay Meals on Wheels for the people who are eligible. So that helps Meals on Wheels um, stretch what they do further. And then in the areas, and I believe um, particularly uh, you probably had the most impact where Meals on Wheels is, finds it harder to get volunteers. We're able to send mom's meals to people so that there's still a way for them to get home delivered meals. Um, at Home with Java came out of our COVID. Um, we basically have a program for people who are homebound or choose not to go out. Um, and so in Fluvanna, we have 78 participants. They get activity packets. They have the opportunity for um, participating via conference calls and then a few Zoom activities and then info emails. Um, and many of our seniors that go to the community centers actually, when they get home, jump online and do some things with that home with Java. Um, conference call bingo is still a big hit that started during COVID and it's still going strong. And then Medicare counseling, 99% satisfaction. That's um, either getting started with Medicare or it's the um, Part D Medicare enrollment for prescriptions. If you've ever had the thrill of helping anybody work that out, it's very complicated and they change it every year. So just when you think you've got a program that works really well for you, um, there's no guarantee that the next year it will. So 50% of the people we see need to change a program. Last This last November, December, we saw 2,600 people, and 
we helped them make a change and it totaled $1.8 million. And the reason I bring that up is that means they're not cutting their pills in half or not filling their prescriptions and that's significant. Next slide. And so I just wanted to remind you our basic um, that purpose is to provide service and supports for seniors so they can age in the community of their choice, Fluvanna. Um, this year, we are making a request of an increase of 5% of 4250 um, because we're trying to balance the need for the ongoing increase in costs for our, um, our employees and figuring out how to help them make sure they've got a livable wage, as well as being aware of the tough times you're up against. So we try and hit a balance of asking for as little as possible. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? I do. Okay. Um, so when you say 1,400 people, does that mean 1,400 total people in Fluvanna you had an interaction with? Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, That's of all specific different types. to Fluvanna. That's not um, our total. So of all different types of services? Yes. Of everything I kind of laid out there. Okay. Yes. Yep. And do you know how many meals you all served? No, but I can get that back to you. Would you please? Yep. Um, both the regular congregate meals and the home delivered meals, both of them. Yeah. And can you okay. break it separately? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and the 78 participants, I think you said online. Right. Well, on phone or online. Okay. <laughs> and that's and that's like bingo or a multitude of different things. Yeah. Also, we is it often have like because triad is really important here. Your sheriff's department's great. So they might come on and do a conference call about scams or there's trivia right. or, you know, bingo. There's seated Tai Chi. Obviously, that's got to be Zoom. But we try and have about 80 to 85 percent be conference calls so that people aren't restricted. One thing we're looking to do next year and we're getting donors to fund it is buying um, tablets and helping pay for people's internet. Because I know you all have really worked hard to get internet in places that didn't have it before and beginning to train seniors who are interested in how to use technology so they can do more. But um, that's that's our big new plan for next year. But that's not part of what we included in our request. It's just something that we're looking for donors to help us get going. Thank you. Do the counselors uh, come to Fluvanna to work with with our seniors for like with Medicare and looking at their plans and do they have to come to town? Um, no, we've been working with um, the centers and having computers at the center mm -hmm. and having someone help them get on. And that way they don't have to drive into Charlottesville and we don't have to try and recruit volunteers out here. When we tried to do that, it was always it was often hard because you've got to go through a lot of training to become a counselor. Obviously, we want to do it right. And so that's been our new thing this year. And I think that really made a big difference for more people to get access. If they can just get to the center, um, then we've got people who can help them get online. So they don't even really need to know how to do it. They just need to show up. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, Any one other more question. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, did you have something? Yeah. I didn't want to jump ahead of you all. So is it a, is there a set amount of hours that's supposed to be um, from Jabba spent like at the community center and so on? And I think don't don't you all go to Kent store? Yep, we have four um, centers that we have a rather unique setup here. Um, back ten years ago, eleven years ago, when there was a huge funding cut, um, we got. We got some money back. A lot of the nonprofits had a cut. Um, and so what the um, county executive at that time worked out with us was that there was a little bit of extra staffing in the Parks and Rec. And so Faith from Parks and Rec actually delivers the activities as sort of part of the senior program of Parks and Rec. And then we deliver the congregate meals, whereas in many other counties where the reimbursement that we get from the county is higher, we actually run the activities at the community center. But we always include faith in our training and any new ideas we have. And then, like I said, our aging service coordinator is working pretty closely so that we're trying to make sure anybody faith's got a concern about she's getting out to see them as well as people all over the county. And did, um, so does that say that there's not a set amount of 
is it contractual how many hours are in these centers and so on or um no really what we contract or make a contract with you is that we will see the people that need to be seen okay. um so we're at kent store we're at um fork union we're at cunningham beaver dam thank you i knew there was a fourth they, one <laughs> they go to the bfw hall and then beaver dam baptist yeah okay and so um you know honestly sometimes more people show up than others usually in the winter it's a little slower just because people don't like going out in the weather but um we've looked at what the enrollment is and that's um, what we put in our projection for next year was an estimate. Um, obviously, the year that we went into COVID, um, yeah. that was off, but then we delivered home delivered meals to all those people instead. So we offset it. But um, we know like how many people right now are getting home delivered meals. And we assume as Stacia gets out there, we'll get more people who are going to be on that list. And, and you said it was the administrator at the time that uh change the agreement the county executive came up with a creative agreement okay um because at that time we were only at fork union and um mm -hmm. it was only two days a week and it was hard to find somebody and the funding was basically half of what we had been getting and so it was instead of increasing mm -hmm. because there was no room to increase funding it was we'll have a county employee work with you and so it's a little bit different than others. And so your reimbursement's lower than the other counties, but it's offset, you know, it all kind of works yeah. out when we work together. <laughs> and was that contractual? So when you say agreement, was that a written agreement or? I don't I, believe it. I, I don't believe it was. It, no. I mean, I guess at any time Parks and Rec could say Faith doesn't have time anymore, but then that's not kind of meeting the needs of the seniors in Fluvanna. So, okay. um, Aaron. Oh, there, they have it. The MOU. MOU. Yeah. MOU. Okay. So, okay. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. you know more detail than I do. Miss hey, 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 Stewart sends us a monthly calendar that has all of these things listed. Activity. That's all has all of her activities yeah. she does with and the, the field trips and things. Because I think once a month she does a field trip and with and each of the centers in Kent store we lost one of the biggest supporters. oh yeah that year, broke Ms. my Keys. heart miss <laughs> keys she, she, a lot of our hearts. she went she went around and literally i think picked up everybody for the first year to get that place going as a community center yes yeah, she did so so is it yeah, I'll, I'll let it go with this so is yeah. it the mou got mentioned so is the mou um I think the memorandum of understanding probably says who does what and who's responsible for what now that now that Aaron brought that up. But, 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 because I normally, um, I guess I should back up and say, because um, you you are newer, we're quasi governmental. So you're required to deliver a certain amount of services to seniors. And so um, years ago, long before me in the 70s, I guess. Um, a contract was written with each county that's in our region and the city of Charlottesville um, saying that we would be the one that would work with you to deliver those services and we can leverage state and federal funds. So you all end up paying about 25% of what it costs us if you put in the fact that faith helps with that. Yeah. Um, and so that's really how it's worked, you know, for years is just we try and leverage donor dollars and state and federal so that it really keeps the cost to you for delivering a more robust program. So the MOU, is it gray enough where the, the changes, um, the MOU is still fully uh, relevant or, or was the MOU more relevant to the old agreement before he made that change, or is it no? It was the, the MOU change the, to the no? It should it should be for the new yes. uh, the, the new way of operating. And, and Kelly and I were just talking. We need to as yeah, we're we going through looking that. at MOUs. Yeah, we to, that's one we're yeah. going to. Okay. And I know when we wrote it, it was only for Union, but as the need grew, as Miss Key said, I wanted a Kent store, and we found that there were a lot of people at Cunningham. It's just grown to meet the I needs think, in your county um, because I think the MOUs, I don't want to say vague enough, but it was about delivering services at a community center, not specifically to Fork Union. Did, and yeah. Did you start? I think you started in Fork Union, of course. Yeah. Then I think you went to Cunningham. 
Mm -hmm. And then we started Kent store. That gave us keys the and idea. Then, and, well, and and then we just started Kent store, and then we went to Beaver Dam. Yeah, yeah. I, so, yeah, that's why I think. Yeah, I think Beaver Dam was the last one. Beaver Dam was the last one. Right. And the hope was to kind of get it so the different sections would be close enough for people to be able to get there or have jaunt take well, them, so they weren't crossing all over the county. Chris, I I remember one of the reasons when we started spreading it out. They asked me to come over and speak one day. Mm -hmm. and I thought Ms. Booker had gone to speak to him. And this was, like I said, years ago. And there were 25 people in it. I was like, you know, we've got a lot of folks at Kent Store that can't make a drive to Fort Kent yeah. or can't yeah. make a drive to. And the and, same and with and Cunningham. And, 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 it fills that Cunningham, BFW yeah. hall. <laughs> the BFW hall. They started going down there and then they started coming up to Kent Store a couple of times. And they like, have a good time too yep and yeah. yeah i have heard that some people and we track it by person so they don't get counted twice but mm -hmm. i do know there are some people who go to more than one center because they meet on different days and good for them that oh, they good. enjoy it that way right. yeah. <laughs> and and um we and aaron and pull all of them together for special events yeah like Christmas, valentine's day valentine's <laughs> day and they just enjoy each other they even pull our senior centers from Greene County and other yep. places come over and meet in our gym yep. and have a good time. So and Fort Union fun. Military Academy wows them all with showing up in their uniforms. Oh, and, and all the um, young women like uh, having them dance with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> okay. And just so the refresh yeah. for Java um, again. So yeah, they were eighty five thousand last year, and they're as as uh, Miss Keen request uh, was noting, they're requesting an increase. So it's eighty nine two fifty for this fiscal year is what they're requesting. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Now we have um, Child Health Partnership. I saw John online. Good evening. Yes, nice. We to were just talking about your program, John. Yes, I I heard it, and I will <laughs> mention a little bit. Uh, okay. Try to clarify a little bit at the end. Um, right. I apologize for not being there in person with you. I'm battling a cold, as you may be able to hear, and I'm going to try to be brief to uh, hope that my voice supports me through this. But um, we really appreciate your um, service and your consideration of our program. Your support for our, our program over the years. Um, we uh, provide services in the home to low-income pregnant women and, and families um, focused on child and family health and positive parenting and family self-sufficiency. So we really work with families based on their goals for their children, um, but in the areas of school readiness for the kids and, and family self-sufficiency. Um, I'm happy to report that um, our Fluvanna County staff um, has stayed in place during the pandemic. So we've been, uh, we've got our long-term staff, um, didn't write down all of them, but our two primary Fluvanna County staff have both been with the program uh, over 15 years now, um, working with families. Um, we do intend, um, have started and intend to continue in the coming year, um, an additional focus on outreach to families and uh, particularly coming out of the pandemic, uh, working to, to reach more families and make sure the community is aware of our services. Um, and I would just add then, uh, happy to answer questions, but add in terms of ready kids, and I, I, um, I hate to speak for them, but the the um, what I know of their services in Fluvanna County particularly focus on uh, support for child care providers and preschools, I think including Head Start. They focus on the quality of child care and helping families uh, find child care that fits their needs. Um, we also have a mental health partnership with Ready Kids um, that provides counseling in, in, in the home for some parents that are that are in our program. Um, so parents that are particularly um, battling with depression or anxiety, um, it's not not a huge number that uh, we can serve, but we partner with them to provide those those services. And I think uh, I don't know if they provide them out in Fluvanna, but I know they provide counseling for uh, for teens and children as well. Um, 
So I think I will stop there and, uh, okay. and be happy to answer any questions. All right, any questions? John, are there any redundancies that you see in, in some of the services you provide and some of what the others do? Um, no, I, I don't. I don't think so, Chris. I, you know, we actually. So, uh, as I said, we provide those services in the home. Um, Ready Kids has a small home visiting program that works in Charlottesville and Albemarle. Um, we see plenty of families for both to serve, but they don't do that service in Fluvanna County. Um, so. Uh, no, you know, we really, again, um, we we are able to provide those parenting resources in the home. This is for, you know, many of our families have a real struggle with transportation. Uh, it frees them up from having to figure out child care um, sort of issues for us to come out in the home. And, you know, uh, part of our team is a community health nurse that comes in and can really help the families focus on on that piece of child health. Um, you know, we have uh, not all our families have kids with particular health concerns, but many of them do uh, are working hard to navigate um, some kind of medical care for their kids through through UVA and other other resources. Um, you also go into Louisa as well. Yes, we do. Any other county? Um, other no, Charlottesville, Albemarle and Fluvanna and Louisa. So we we have our office in uh, um in Troy, in Zion Crossroads, that serves Slovenia and Louisa. Okay. Yes. Yeah, they're located right up there. Right. Uh, the old, the, the old model homes. Yeah, mm -hmm. we are right on the line. Yep. Yes. But it, but in Slovenia. Yes. Thank uh, you. Yeah. How, how many times do you visit a home in a week or a month? So it averages about twice a month. Um, we really require that it be at least once a month. And, uh, you know, typically, again, the, the family has a team of both uh, a parent educator and a nurse. Typically, those visits are done separately. So they'll get one visit focused on, on health issues and another one that focuses more on the parenting and, um, and any economic issues or struggles they may be, may be dealing with. And how long have you been doing this service? We have been doing the service since 1991, and I've seen a little bit of conflicting numbers, but um, for Fluvanna County, it, it was 94 or 95. So we are we are headed for, for 30 years in Fluvanna County. Right. And it used to be called CHIP. Yes, it used to be called CHIP. Um, we changed about three years ago to Child Health Partnership. Um, people were confusing us with uh, housing particularly in Charlottesville and Albemarle uh, or, or with children's health insurance from the, the, the federal uh, SCHIP program. So uh, we decided it had been talked about a long time and we decided that that child health partnership would be a little clearer. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, and then Eric. Yeah, you... I'll show you. Yes, yeah, yeah, thank, thank you all so much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, 4%, see. right? 50, uh, 50 here we go. Um, so last year, or well, the current fiscal year, um, funding was 54,121. They're requesting 55,203. Mm -hmm. So about a about eleven dollars increase, yeah. roughly. Okay, thank you. And next is MACA. Anyone online for MACA? Sarah's there. Sarah. Oh, she's joining now. Okay. So, Dr. Hanks. If you want, maybe we can go to the next. She's there. Oh, she's, she's there. there. Okay. Oh, yeah, she is there. there she, yeah. <clears throat> Dr. Hanks, unmute yourself. There. Hello, friends. Hi. Hi. Hello. All I'm right. so sorry. Thank uh -huh. you for allowing me to join virtually this evening. Okay, good. And you have five minutes, um, Dr. Hanks. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so okay. much. 
Well, Board of Directors, it is a, a Board of Supervisors. It's a pleasure to join you this evening. And I first want to thank you for the opportunity to join virtually. My family has been not unwell this week. And so it's such a blessing to be able to serve the community and our agency as, as well as my family. You see our request um, and it hasn't changed much from the prior several years. Uh, we have a slight increase in our request to accommodate the many changes in Fluvanna County. Um, a few of those include the expansion of our emergency assistance work. I'll highlight that in a moment. Um, the continued partnership with Fluvanna County Public Schools for Head Start programming and continued work with Fluvanna County Public High School uh, for project discovery serving income eligible first generation college students. In regards to emergency assistance, I know you know our programming well. I'd like to thank you for honoring and supporting Ms. Bertha Armstrong. Um, although she has retired from the agency, her voice and her work is still active. Her legacy is outstanding, and we appreciate your recognition and support of her tenure and the success of the agency under her leadership in Fluvanna. As we move forward, we've recently hired Diane Rosario, who I've recently introduced to county administrators. Um, she will be serving as our emergency assistance manager. She has been on the job just a week now and has been in Fluvanna almost every day. She is utilizing Fluvanna as her primary office right now, getting to know your community first and foremost. She'll be supervising our emergency assistance team, which will include the expansion of staff for an emergency assistance specialist and a food pantry coordinator, both of which we will be posting for hire within the next week. I'll share those postings with the county so they can be widely circulated as well. You're familiar with our food pantry operation and proposal to relocate the food pantry. I've just today been able to provide county administrators with an update on that work and an anticipated timeline within the next week or so, pending some of our follow-up conversations. So we're actively moving in that direction. The thrift store has been liquidated. The community rallied to support that work, and we're thrilled about the expansion. In regards to Head Start, our classroom is full. We've recently begun recruitment for the upcoming academic year. With the support of Ms. Booker and others in the community, we have a new procedure in our Head Start classroom. We've been supported incredibly well by Ms. Barnaby and the staff at Fluvanna County Public Schools. And we're working with our students that will be transitioning to kindergarten next year. What an exceptional opportunity it is for them to be experiencing preschool in the same building. They'll be arriving for kindergarten, getting to know the routines, the space, the staff, and feeling really comfortable and confident in their academic career moving forward. Lastly, project discovery is more of the same with many new opportunities this year because of um, restrictions that have been lifted regarding COVID-19. We've resumed in-person campus visits. We've completed four campus visits to date, and Fluvanna County students have participated in each of those. We have four more scheduled this semester. In addition to that, we have monthly workshops, individualized coaching, resources for mentorship, job placement, and interns. We're seeing an expansion in that work in Fluvanna, and we're really pleased to see the active students that are coming through our program. We're confident that we'll be able to support them in job and career development opportunities, as well as their pursuit of post-secondary education. I'd like to pause and leave a few moments for questions. I know you know our work well. So if there is anything I haven't highlighted this evening that would be important for you to know in consideration of our request, I'd be happy to address that this evening. We're very well done. Um, I'm very familiar with everything that you're doing. I'm glad to see you moving in, in those directions. And we're looking forward to walking into the new food pantry, the new store. <laughs> We're very excited. Um, yes. Ms. Rosario is doing a lot of benchmarking. So she's taking the best practices from many food pantries in our region and across the country. Uh, I'm hopeful that we'll be on the list for future food pantries to showcase the very best in putting clients first in our services. It'll be a unique opportunity for Fulvana County and we're, we're pleased to be offering that service. Do you know how many um, Project Discovery students at the high school have an idea of how many she's working with? 
Ms. Booker, I'll have to get that updated number. We run our attendance and enrollments at the end of each month and report those to Project Discovery. Would you be comfortable if I follow up on February 1st yes, with a confirmed that's fine. No, Harry. I just like we typically know. do a first semester and then second semester recruitment effort. And so the second semester typically does garner those students who have a new or renewed interest in focusing on their post-graduation success. Mm -hmm. So I anticipate we'll have some updated information in the next week. Okay. Any questions from board members? Anyone? Thank you so much, um, Dr. Hanks, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your service. Um, OAR. Yeah, let me just show really quick. Justin here. Area so Community. So from MACA. Good evening. Hi. Hello. So MACA has requested yes, 60,000 60, yep, and they are mm -hmm. currently at 55. Right. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good to see everybody again. My name is Ross Carew. I'm the director of OAR Jefferson Area Community Corrections, and we are a regional community corrections uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, we have uh, 32 staff, two offices. We serve about 4,000 people annually. We're funded primarily through federal, state, local, and foundation money. Um, we're making a request for two of our programs um, for Fluvanna, um, our local probation program and our criminal justice planner. So for local probation, um, Fluvanna has projected $1.3 million in detention costs uh, for FY22 through 26. Um, it costs about a hundred dollars a day for someone to spend at the Central Virginia Regional Jail. So each diversion into local probation saves the county about forty-one hundred dollars in avoided jail costs. Uh, we served ninety participants last year, um, approximately eight percent of the total served by the program. That equates to about three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars in jail bed day cost avoidance. Our success rate is 72%. Our three-year reoffense rate is 26%, which is great compared to the national average of 43%. We had some uh, we had a researcher look at our recidivism rate and determined that successful completers are 2.5 times less likely to reoffend completing probation. And one of the reasons why that is is. Um, we're a state and national leader in evidence-based practices. We do risk assessment. We have specialized caseloads, motivational interviewing, individualized case plan based on risk, and our interventions are uh, designed to be cognitive behavioral. So that's our local probation program. Let, let me go back. Sorry. Uh, we are asking for 82 uh, $8,219. It's a $391 increase. It's about 5%. For the criminal justice planner, um, this position is solely funded through uh, local money. Um, you probably have had Mr. Goodlow come out and present um, all of the data that he prepares, but what he is, is he's the staff to the um, uh, CCJB, which is the Thomas Jefferson Area Community Criminal Justice Board. Dave Wells, the Lake Monticello, the newly uh, assigned Lake Monticello Police Chief, and Amanda Galloway, the Assistant Commonwealth Attorney, are the Fluvanna reps. And the, his job is to support the work of that group. Uh, he has active projects, and he is the project lead for the UVA Systems Engineering Capstone Mental Health and Criminal Justice System Analysis. He is leading the CCJB three-year strategic plan um, with the assistance of the National Association of Counties. He does the annual report that you all see for each of the jurisdictions we serve. He's also leading the sequential intercept model, criminal justice analysis, and he's also a member of the drug court advisory team. So those are the two programs that we're asking for funding for the uh, for Fluvanna. But I also wanted to share a little bit about the rest of our programs. So we also have a pretrial program, office in Orange and in Charlottesville. We have the Charlottesville Albemarle Drug Court, Fluvanna Drug Court. Um, we're now going to be starting uh, Nelson County Drug Court, an Orange and Madison County Drug Court, 
the Charlottesville Albemarle Therapeutic Docket, and we have two different reentry programs servicing Albemarle Charlottesville Regional Jail and the Central Virginia Regional Jail. Um, we serve through all of those various different programs, uh, 233 different individuals for Fluvanna County. Uh, we partner with Fluvanna in a lot of different ways uh, with the drug court, um, with our reentry services, and then we also have two Fluvanna County uh, folks um, on our executive board, and that's Jeff Hayslip, who you know is the Commonwealth Attorney, and Aisha williams Cusano, who you heard is the Fluvanna Region 10 Director. Current challenges, um, as you've probably heard, is the Funding doesn't keep pace with uh, the cost of living, um, especially when you factor in the cost of living in Central Virginia. Our salaries are approximately 10% behind similarly situated positions. So what happens is, is we train them up and they go to Chesterfield and Henry Go or yeah. uh, Northern Virginia. I'm sorry, I, I'm, one more page. Um, the other challenge is rural service delivery. You know, proximity to services is a challenge, um, as you know. And so uh, as director, as a Fluvanna County resident, I am trying really hard to bring services into the outlying county. And as you can see, if you've been here a while, you can see uh, the uh, scope of OAR is, in, is coming uh, bigger and bigger into Fluvanna County. Um, just wanted to say thank you. Like many of the preceding folks, um, Fluvanna County and OAR are a longstanding partner. Um, we support, um, the mission of the county and hope that the county supports our mission. Um, also wanted to give a particular shout out to Eric and to Tori. They um, have done yeoman's work, both in engaged and enthusiastic work with the drug court. So I just really appreciate that. Thank you for thanking them. Okay, any questions? I, I, I'm sorry, I got a, a little lost in your earlier math. Sure. So how many people how do we how do we how did you assess the impact on people in Fluvanna? The meaning the, the, the people the, the served, people served yeah. or uh, so we um our clientele, so I count up the clients, and then also it's cost avoidance for jail. Uh, but and I'm sorry, uh, so how many people? There was 233. That's that's Fluvanna. That's Fluvanna okay. only. Luvanna only. That's right. I think that's where I got lost because I was. Yeah, I'm sorry. Many people. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Do the um, POs come out to Fluvanna County? Yes, ma'am. So yeah. we have staff out here um, weekly. Um, okay. Our drug court staffs out here. Uh, they're out here on the weekends. I mean, right. we're, we're out here all Good. the time. Good. Thank you. I always learn something new when they come before and give all the and read all of this. Um, I'm I'm all, I'm continuously learning about all the things that all of these nonprofits do. Well, as, as am I back mm -hmm. here in, in, in the, it's, uh, it's remarkable. Yeah, some of the work that really a lot is. of these groups do. Yeah. So thank we you all. It. Thank, thank you. you. All. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Piedmont housing Alliance. I bet it's once someone on zoom. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just... I see a little lady just smiling. <laughs> is that Oh, here she is. I just, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't even recognize you. And, and just really quick, just finish yeah. up. So for OAR, okay. they requested 14,677. The current year, they're at 14,163. So about a $500 increase overall. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for having me today. Yeah. Thank you for your support in the past and hopefully your support in the future. And uh, wait, so just let me know when you want me to proceed on the and, Okay, perfect. Give us your Next name. Slide. Uh, my name is Kristen Lucas. I'm the director of housing counseling and economic opportunity with Piedmont. What was the last name? Lucas. Lucas. Okay. Um, so yeah, so um, y'all have been supporting PHA for a while. So I'm not going to go into all of the nitty gritty details. I'm really just going to highlight some of the new programs and resources that we have, and then some of the um, impacts and outcomes that we've seen. So um, for PHA services, uh, two things that I really want to highlight that started last year for us. Um, we started some housing navigation um, at Piedmont Housing Alliance. So having a staff member who can field those calls 
um, and help people um, hopefully find a rental that works for them, whether it's a, you know, it might be a one hour conversation with them. It might be a conversation over the span of, you know, weeks or months um, to find them that rental that works. And then another program that we um, have started um, and have been working on last year as well as the Financial Opportunity Center. And with the Financial Opportunity Center, really it combines um, uh, employment coaching, financial coaching, and benefit supports. And so with all of those three things combined, our hope is that that person can then, you know, navigate that financial ladder, take that next step or those next steps um, and achieve those dreams that they have, whether it's home ownership, purchasing a new car, saving more money, whatever that thing might be. Uh, next slide, please. So some PHA resources that are or the main PHA resource that I want to highlight that was new last year and will continue on into this year is the VERP program or the Virginia Eviction Reduction Program. And so with the VERP program, it's really using funds um, to maybe help somebody catch up on their utilities or maybe help somebody, you know, pay that auto loan or maybe help somebody um, pay a rental application fee so that they can keep the rental that they're in or find a rental and hopefully never fall into homelessness. Um, so that's the VERP program. And, and with the VERP program, last year we were able to distribute, between May of last year and December, we were able to distribute $150,000. Um, this year we were awarded $275,000. Some of that will go to you know staffing cost, um, but we're really excited that we were able to use that last year and we'll be able to use that this year. Um, I will say with the VERP program, we definitely have some expansion to do. We weren't able to use it for any folks in Fluvanna County, but it is an eligible area. Um, and so hopefully we can do a little bit more outreach here so that more folks in Fluvanna can use the VERP program because it is amazing. And it's like money with no strings. You know, everybody loves money with no strings. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. All right. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about housing counseling specifically and some of the programs that we have. Next, Next slide. <laughs> Um, so uh, we had we worked with 34 uh, clients one on one with our housing counseling services. So that could have been um, pre-purchase, rental counseling, default foreclosure, things like that. Um, and with those one on one clients, some of the outcomes that we saw last year were um, someone was able to bring their mortgage current. Um, someone was able to get their mortgage modified. So, again, kind of staying in their home. That's really something that we like to you know help people do. Um, and then 11 of the folks that we worked with were able to purchase a house. Um, in addition, again, with that housing navigation, we were able to serve some folks in Fluvanna County. So um, we worked with nine people in Flu Fluvanna County around housing navigation. Next slide. And then group education, as you can see here, um, a lot of the group education um, was geared around pre-purchase counseling, just kind of getting an idea of what are some of the resources that are out there that could help somebody achieve, you know, that wonderful milestone, milestone um, of purchasing a home. Next slide. Um, and then down payment assistance. Um, so with down payment assistance, 25% of our clients um, uh, through the SPARC program came from Fluvanna County, or they were purchasing a home in Fluvanna County. And what the SPARC program does, it will it will lock in the interest rate and it will lower the interest rate for somebody getting a Virginia housing mortgage. So instead of it being, you know, 4%, it would be 3%. Right now, it's looking like, you know, instead of it being 7%, it's 6%, which, you know, over the life of the loan, that's going to save that person tens of thousands of dollars. That's at no cost to the client. That's just through meeting with the housing counselor um, at least once so we can talk about their budget and start that relationship just in case something happens in the future, just in case they need to work with us um, down the line. And then we um, also had a couple of folks um, participate in the down payment loan program and the, and the VITA program. Um, so with the, the down payment loan program, one community member used that. Um, I think it was um, 24 to 25,000 that they received in a down payment loan. And with the loan that they received after 10 years, it will be forgiven. So that's just equity. That's just money in their pocket. Um, which is amazing. They also use the SPARC program. Uh, we also had someone use the VITA program, which is a matched savings program. So for every dollar they invest, um, they would get a match of uh, $8, I think it was. Um, and that could go towards their down payment or their closing cost. And that person also used the SPARC program. So in total, through these three programs, nine households used either SPARC, down payment, VITA, or you know a combination of those 
and that um, was 44, you know, community members that were impacted, um, and they were able to purchase their first house. And I think that's all. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? So that um, it might have been the spark, but the, so that you mentioned in 10 years, the down payment gets forgiven. Can you? Yeah. So that's the that's the down payment loan program, and with the down payment loan program, we get those loans through a variety of sources. Some of that money is PHA money. Some of that money comes from DHCD home. Some of the money comes from, you know, Albemarle County or Louisa, it just depends. And each source of funding has its own repayment terms. Um, so the DHCD home money, um, it will be forgiven after five, 10 or 15 years. It's all based on the amount of money that you borrow. Um, think if you borrow under 15,000, it's five years forgiveness. Um, if you borrow under 40,000, it's 10 years. And then if you borrow over 40,000, it's 15 years. Most families fall into that 10 year period. So I, <clears throat> I'm sure there's something I'm just missing. So if it's a down payment, but it's mm -hmm. forgiven, how, how is that a down payment? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's money, right? Like it's going to closing. It's helping reduce the amount that they are borrowing. There's no monthly payment attached to it. Folks can make a monthly payment if it makes sense. And sometimes it does, um, but they don't have to. And then again, with some of those sources, it will be forgiven after X amount of years, as long as you have stayed in the home, it's still your primary residence. And normally if you haven't done like a cash out refinance. So if, if those things are met and you hit that affordability period, it's it's forgiven. So why would you send in money towards your down payment? <laughs> yeah. So again, some of the I know, right? Some of the terms are different. So if maybe you purchased a home and you're thinking, ah, you know, in 10 years, this probably isn't going to work for my family. And maybe you also have a down payment loan that is not forgiven. Mm -hmm. Um, or maybe it carries interest because some of them do. It's not our first line for folks, um, but it is an option. Um, and so if that's the case, if you know you're really not going to stay there um, and you know that there's going to be interest or it's not going to be forgiven, it may be in your interest to to make those payments, but it's not mandatory. You don't so have do you to. know if it's going to be forgiven up front? Yeah. Yeah. So why would if you know it's going to be forgiven, why would anybody send money? I don't know if I would. <laughs> Yeah, and left again. So it's yeah. it's almost not logical no. to, to. Yeah, no, I would say for the folks that get the DHCD money and we sit them down nowadays and we're like, here are your options. You know, sometimes um, they really value time. And so these are your loan options, right? If you want to close in 30 days, sometimes they really value like the dollars and cents and they're willing to wait. So then DHCD is the option. Um, so it really depends, but we do have that conversation with them so they can go in, hopefully with their eyes wide open um, and, you know, knowing that they have some options. And uh, Verp, can you go back to, to you, yeah. something that you said something about 150 yeah. grand? What, yeah. what were you saying about Verp? Can you describe that again? Yeah. So Verp, it's the Virginia Eviction Reduction Program. It's also something through DHCD. Um, and what we have been using it for is to offset rent or offset cost. So then that person can put money towards their rental if they are falling behind or if they are going to fall behind. So a lot of the VERP money went towards utility bills, um, maybe car payments or, you know, just random things, random bills that that person may have. And then they can shift that money towards their rent. Um, but it could also be used for application fees or things like that for a person who maybe did lose that rental, unfortunately, and is trying to find the next one. So it's, it's, and this isn't a gotcha question. I'm just trying to be sure I understand it. Yeah. So there's a variety of different expenses a household could have. Yes. And this is public money paying for some of their expenses that they're now, for whatever reason, not paying. Right. It's going towards like their utility. So then that money goes towards their rent. So it's not paying their rent, right? But it's going to pay the $150 you know, light bill. Um, so they then have that $150 to hopefully catch back up on their rent. And so they're not evicted. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. To go okay. back. We have the Thomas Jefferson EMS. And PHA yeah. again for and 23 currently is mm -hmm. 2750 and they're requesting $4,500 okay. for this fiscal year. I wish I'd asked why the such an increase. 
Do you know, Eric? Um, I don't. I mean, she could potentially. I'm sorry. Can we just get that quick question answered? Just wondering why such an increase. With, with housing counseling in particular. Up to the mic, yes, yeah. sorry. Um, with housing counseling in particular, right? That's I think that's what we're hoping for. Um, it takes a lot, you know, it takes a lot to get somebody to that place where they can either purchase a home or find a rental or keep that rental. And so that's what we are um, asking for in that increase. It's an acknowledgement that it takes a lot. Uh, I think one of the people that use the VITA program, they've been working with a housing counselor off and on for about 10 years, you know? Um, so, yeah. So why is it taking more now but for that much of an increase? What What's the difference between this year and last year? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's something we could have asked for, you know, in the past. We just haven't. I think we were consistently asking for the twenty-seven fifty. I think that's what we said. Uh, and and, and I, I would have to go back too, because remember, just because what we what they received in the budget last year doesn't necessarily mean what they requested well, they last year yeah. either. I got you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, come in today and talk. Uh, I was under um, the grip uh, in December, and you didn't want to see me at all. So <laughs> I do apologize for the opportunity to come and see you tonight. Uh, my name is Pepe Winchell. I'm the director for Thomas Jefferson EMS Council. And just to give you a quick oversight, uh, I'm one of uh, 11 councils in the state of Virginia that is identified in code that uh, exists to help liaison between OEMS, the Virginia Department of Health uh, Office of EMS and the EMS agencies and EMS providers. Um, we have, uh, Fluvanna has 15% of the EMS providers uh, of the 1,500 that exist in the, uh, the, the my council that uh, uh, seven counties in the city of Charlottesville. And I'm requesting a 5% um, uh, oh, 5% of my budget is what I'm requesting uh, from Fluvanna, Fluvanna County. The hardest thing right now is uh, I'm going to kind of reflect on Mr. Fairchild's experience in working with uh, the uh, being part of the uh, uh, Fire and Rescue Association. I have three pillars, and it's collaboration, communication, and customer service. And as I'm looking through uh, the other nonprofits that are also seeking uh, requests, those are the folks that I'm I've been collaborating with region 10 trying to identify a continuum of care so that we can address behavioral crises and appropriate response to them as well as taking care of the the providers and make sure that they're of sound uh, headspace uh, when they're responding in a, an emergency situation um working with uh, uh java so that the continuum of care if uh, a geriatric is brought to the hospital that when they do get home um, the, the, the recovery is positive and there's positive outcomes. Um, and even providing CPR training to the child health uh, program. Uh, so our, our range of services is vast. And if you asked me six months ago, um, if one of our services was planning for Ebola, I would not have even put that on my plate of things as, as a possibility. So one of the things that I can't do is tell you what you're going to be uh, what services you're going to need in six months, in a year, in 18 months. Um, but I do have a couple things that you're probably going to be challenged with. One of those is as uh, we have, uh, Fluvanna has um, two uh, rescue units, one at Lake Monticello, very active, very strong volunteer organization, and then the, the county services. And with that contract uh, ending and the transition to whatever Fluvanna's next iteration is, that is going to be a challenge. The spice to those challenges is current legislation. So as the councils are trying to uh, communicate to the local associations like the FRA, is uh, making sure that all of the uh, EMS, uh, all the emergency or emergency organizations understand the challenge. Right now there's legislation looking at bringing paramedics into the hospitals to serve and function uh, to help with the nursing shortage. Well, what that is doing is pulling from the field units and Peter, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so the, the challenge of, of staffing um, uh, your units 
uh, in the fall, uh, you know, uh, six months, 10 months from now is going to be a, a major challenge. And that's one of the things that I've been able to do is go out to job fairs within the counties, um, looking out. And again, going back to not uh, taking from Peter to pay Paul, if we recruit from other councils um, just outside of our borders, that is great, but they're doing the same thing mm -hmm. from us. Um, so I'm looking at going to Maryland, going to West Virginia, trying to recruit people in and providing those opportunities for for Savannah and for the other uh, uh, counties within the in the within the council. Um, the, a couple of the other things that we're doing as we're communicating, um, Miss Smith um, is a director for on our board of directors for the council. Uh, Mr. Lai, John Lai is uh, the deputy chief uh, for Lake Monticello. He's the president for the board of directors of, of the council. So having two people uh, within Fluvanna County being able to voice their concerns about what the council needs in terms of services is fabulous. Uh, we provide enormous amount of training for uh, the responders in the in the in, in Fluvanna County, and having and again, having a, a very strong and active Lake Monticello is a great way to recruit um, inexperienced EMTs from UVA to come and travel out to Fluvanna. Um, and, and as I keep thinking about uh, Mr. Fairchild he's really been drinking out of the fire hose of, of information has been part of uh, the FRA meetings and just expose it. The biggest thing that I'd like to do is not be involved to the point where I'm on the front page of the newspaper. Uh, but if I'm providing the support to Mr. Dahl, Ms. Smith, Mr. Lai, so that Lavanna County has quality patient care when needed, if needed, then I've done my job. And that's why I'm looking at uh, a 5% increase uh, right now. Like I said, there's a 5%. Um, let me take two steps back. The vast majority of my budget comes from, directly from the state. It is required to have a 25% match to um, to offset what the the Commonwealth is providing me. I'm asking for 5% from Fluvanna County. Right now, I'm looking at um, grants and donations and reaching out to the business communities of all my counties to help alleviate some of the uh, stresses on the individual municipalities. I'm just not there yet. Uh, I've been with the council for 18 months and I plan on being here for a very long time. Uh, but right now I'm looking at a modest 5% increase, uh, about $800 uh, increase from what I had asked for last year. Any questions? No. Thank you. All right, Thank absolutely. You Thank much. you, appreciate it. Last is Central Virginia Small Business. And just really quick here, just as he yeah, said. But, uh, yeah, I'll say that while you just mentioned it. Yep, right. Thanks. T Jim's, T -Jim's, T -Jim's. here we go. So yeah, again, 16.9 is what was funded last year. 17.745 is the request okay. this Thank year. Thank you. All right. I see some move. Oh, I see Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mozelle. How's everybody? Thank you all for letting us attend virtually. And before we get started, I wanted to introduce you all to Ariel Bretter. I'm hoping you can see her on the screen. Yes. Ariel, you want to say hi? Hello. Thanks for hi. having us tonight. I was watching here. I was wondering. Yep. Um, Ariel is our new assistant director. She's a certified right. business coach. Um, she's growth wheel certified, and she is been spending a fair amount of time in Fluvanna County. So great. Okay. Yeah. All okay. right. Rebecca, we have five minutes. So. All right. I'll get to it then. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, yeah, thank you for advancing the slides. So um, as you all know, I believe, you, you know, SBDC um, has grown significantly in the past few years. We've been the top SBDC in the state uh, for the last two. And the small businesses that, that we serve can range from, you know, 500 employees to 300 million in sales. So there's, you know, we'll work with sole proprietors and startups um, and our current clients, our largest client does over 26 million in sales. So there's really a, a significant bandwidth that we cover um, and have a number of tools, uh, experts, basically resources that are local, state, federal, even international to help businesses. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, so this just gives you a little overview of, of some of the things that we do. We also have quite a toolbox of professional tools. Um, 
The tools that we use are those that are used by professional consulting firms, and those are paid for by the state office. So there's quite a bit that's offered throughout the region um, that is not a part of our budget and is available to the community. And the data at the bottom, you know, demonstrates that companies that work with SBDCs tend to have very high success rates. Next slide. And Fluvanna County is the most winning for pitch competitions locally. Yes. Um, you all make a lot of winners there. So just wanted to show you a quick snapshot of that. Next slide. Um, I wanted to show you a snapshot of numbers over a five-year period. We've clearly seen an increase. Um, as you all are aware, the SBDC has been significantly reinvented in the last three years. The office size has increased, um, as has service. And these numbers are outdated already. Um, we just sent out our impact survey for the last fiscal year, actually the last calendar year, which is upping these numbers. So I wanted to share a couple of those changes. Um, clients served um, is correct, but um, the jobs created has jumped from what we thought was 27 new jobs for the companies that we assisted in Fluvanna to 38. Um, and on the next slide, we show capital formation, and that is approaching a million dollars. We're over $800,000, and um, we've just gotten a few additional responses to the survey. So I wanted to share that news with you all. Um, next slide shows a number of the things that we've done in person um, in 2022. We've been there quite a lot. Um, we've done a number of programs specifically for Fluvanna in Fluvanna, um, and a number as well that uh, were online, but quite a number of visits. And um, we've also established office hours in Fluvanna on a regular basis um, with the business advisor coming and meeting with clients there. Next slide. Um, there are, however, 80 training programs. There were 80 last year and I think 84 the year before. Um, whenever someone has a need or we have a group of people that need a specific type of training, we, we put it together and we put it out there. And that ranges from everything to starting your business, um, international um, capabilities, SWAM certification, you know, branding, marketing, whatever businesses are looking for, as well as some industry-specific work. Um, we did a food and beverage cohort. We have a group that is all light manufacturing, high tech. We have another group forming that is software companies. So we really run the gamut um, with programs and offerings. Next slide. And this is how we do it. Um, we've reinvented a little bit this year. We're cutting back significantly on contractors for 2023-24 um, and have a core team now of five people. Um, Ariel, who you just met, is has primary responsibility for five municipalities, including Fluvanna. Rosie, who was just hired um, and is still undergoing training, has the other five. So we have, you know, core solid uh, team members. We've moved away from the emergency model that was handling the pandemic of lots of contractors, and we're stabilizing the core team. Um, and that's also going to save us a little bit of money. Next slide, please. So our ask, we've um, made the same request for the last three years. Our advisory board is made up, up of the economic development professionals, and um, they have agreed to a rate that uh, is per capita, and that number for Fluvanna is 15,752. And we're very grateful um, for the increase that you all made last year. That made a huge difference for us. We really appreciate that. Um, and we also have the request, again, we wanted to ask if you would consider moving us to the Economic Development Office budget. We really do report to Jennifer Schmack in a number of ways. Um, she is our partner as we are hers. Um, that's the way we operate with a number of the Economic Development Offices in the territories uh, because we work very closely with them. Um, and again, the numbers on this slide, I apologize, are outdated because they're bigger <laughs> now that we're doing some surveys. Um, but just, you know, highlighted a few of the, the other things that we do. Next slide. And this is the territory. Um, 
we cover 10 municipalities. Um, and I did want to share if I have another few seconds, um, we are going after a, another Go Virginia grant this year, which is specifically for rural entrepreneurship connection. And we, if we get that grant, uh, we just submitted it, we will hire another part-time person who will do rural, rural community outreach. Um, and help us implement some of the programs that we found to be very successful in an even more um, meaningful and connective way. Okay, any questions for Rebecca? If not, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks so much for allowing us to come and present. Yeah. And just, I think, I think this might be more of a, a question for staff and the board. Well, so first of all, and I had written through something here, so I might have gotten the, I might have put a pen mark through. This shows a four hundred and seventy three percent increase. Is that, that is that's correct. Is what it is. From so the, so their current budget is ten thousand, and they're going up to they're requesting fifteen seven fifty two. But yes, that is that is a four hundred seventy three percent. Is it? Do you mean a? It's more how, like how, a fifty-seven percent increase. Oh, no, no. Right, oh you know, there must be a formula yeah. on the sheet. There must be a formula. Yeah, couldn't be. <laughs> I struggled to know. Oh, you know what? Yeah, hold on here. Let me. Not let that me. much. It's a. It's, 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 50, it's, it's there's a fifty-one. There's a formula yeah. error. It, it went back to a prior right. funding. I gotcha. Yeah, couldn't be. It's fifty-seven percent. Yeah, let me. Five hundred seventy. That's it. Let me do one. All okay. these thousand dollar increase. Yeah. Yeah. All the whole thing was need to be updated. Okay. So to the board. So maybe the requests were higher in the years and you all didn't approve it. But so it was twenty five hundred. Then for three years, twenty seven fifty. Suddenly last year it jumped to ten thousand, and then we're at more than fifty percent increase this year. What What was the was it was the re request higher? Last last year, no, in the past, in the years of, I'm trying to figure out how we yeah. go from from years of 2750 or lower to ten thousand. Yeah, for, for, for years it was higher, and 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 they weren't. For years in the past, I want to say there was incremental increases for for a lot of the nonprofits, and I'm trying to remember a little bit back to last year. I know comparing what Fluvanna County does and the services it utilizes through the SBDC versus what the funding was, we were we were below where where we were with our counterparts and the services that we were getting from SBDC. So does anybody know what the decision making was to remain below and, and not fund to a higher amount? Yeah, I, don't I, think, I, I think that's been I, last year. Well, I think it's generally with a lot of the nonprofits, mm -hmm. we've never fully funded their requests what 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 they request maybe there's some that that ask for incremental requests but i think so, generally speaking right since time is is important right now 618 i don't want to leave chris's question not answered but if you could wait and maybe we bring that up and well get I, an answer. and i think too i think once we get into the budget work yeah. sessions you yeah. know I, I think there'll be a lot of time to really get in into her the explanation too when you read all the things, it may be some there, but we will remember. Yeah, remember that. In per capita, we know. So we had could I offer? A, I have a. It has been the same budget request for the last three years, um, and prior to that, I think it was around twelve thousand that was requested, and the service was not um, the same prior to twenty twenty. Um, and if it's helpful, Fluvanna is the only remaining county that is not. Um, at the agreed to per capita rate um, by our advisory board. And our advisory board is made up of all of the economic development officers in the region. Yeah, and I think you've mentioned that before. Yeah, I, mean, I, would, I would say that, yeah. you know, as economic opportunities have increased in Savannah, the dependency and use of, of the, of the, um, Small business. And the small business yeah. uh, development center there is um, you know, probably increased. increased along, but that would be a, something that Jennifer could speak to. Right? Yeah. Well, let's just leave it right now yeah. because we want to get back here at yeah, seven. Yeah, yeah I think so, really during the work sessions, yeah. I mean, we can get into, we, yeah. I mean, we can right. on the fly pull up more, you know, yeah. uh, so, you know path um, documents. Tony, 
Mr. Chair, I move the Solana County Board of Supervisors enter into a closed meeting pursuant to the provisions of Section 2.2-3711A1, Section 2.2-3711A7, Section 2.2-3711A19 of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended for the purpose of discussing personnel, employment appointment, two, uh, I'm sorry, litigation, flint condemnation, public safety, structure of emergency services. <clears throat> Okay. I was, was going to say, I think she identifies oh, as Mrs. Chair. Madam. We need um, a second. I'm just sorry you say that. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Where's the second? Second. Okay. Second uh, motion by Mr. O'Brien, second by Ms. Fairchild, go in closed session. We are now. Oh, we got a vote. Oh, we got the vote. All right. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Any opposed? Chair vote second. We are now in closed close session. <laughs>
Yes, thank you. Here's me, James. Here. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, now we have to come out of closed session. Madam Chair, I move the closed meeting be adjourned and the Savannah County Board of Supervisors convene again in open session. Be resolved, the Board of Supervisors does hereby certify to the best of each member's knowledge. One, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirement requirements under section 2.2-3711A of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended. And two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened, were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting. Do we have a second? Second. I just got moved by Mr. O'Brien. Yeah. Roll. Second. Roll. Yeah. Roll. Okay. And second by Mrs. Eager. All in favor, Mr. Fairchild? Aye. Ms. Eager? Aye. Mr. O'Brien? Aye. Mr. Sheridan? Aye. And Chair votes aye. Okay. I'd like to call to order our evening uh, business for J January the 20th, 20, 2023. We welcome you all here. At this time, we want to stand and say the pledge and have a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the which stands one nation. Thank you. First, <clears throat> I'd like to apologize for our coming out of closed session and starting this meeting about 15 minutes late. Thank you for your patience. Um, we were do, taking care of business and we had to complete that. But now we are ready to get into the adoption of the agenda. I think we have one. With, yeah, just, just two things, Madam Chair. One, under presentations, the Central Virginia Regional Housing Partnership mm -hmm. presentation, they asked to reschedule that. Okay. Um, so they won't be here this evening. And the other item uh, under public hearing, under uh, uh, item I, ZMP 2204, the applicant has requested a 60-day deferral um, uh, for that item. Uh, for a uh, further wetland uh, delineation study for the property. All right. So I need a motion to adopt the agenda with the change. So may second. All right. Chairman, the, yes. Uh, the motion relates to uh, ZMP 22 colon 04. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so we have um, a motion by, who made the motion? How about Mr. Sheridan, second? Your second, Mr. O'Brien. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Uh, anyone opposed? If not, the motion is carried. Chair votes aye. Now we would like to do the county administrator of your report. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, members of the boards have a few things to report this evening. Um, so one, Fluvanna County Department of Social Services coordinated the Christmas Sponsors Program again this year. They had 33 sponsors, which provided Christmas gifts for uh, 30 seniors and 121 children. A big thanks goes to Jane Wilson, who does a phenomenal job coordinating this program every year. And she's been doing it for a while, and she does a great job putting together uh, um, donors and sponsors and, and families and families and children and, and adults in need. So, so certainly want to thank her. Um, January is National Stalking Awareness Month. Uh, the Department of Justice's definition of stalking is, hold on one second here, sorry, okay. is engaging a course of conduct directed at a spe specific purpose, specific person that would cause re a reasonable person to fear for his or her safety or the safety of others or suffer substantial emotional stress. Again, stalking behavior can include uh, numerous things, unwanted phone calls, emails, texts, social media messages, uh, approving, 
uh, approaching a victim or, or showing up unwanted to a victim's home, watching or following a victim, or, or doing or leaving things to let the victim know you've been there. Again, if anyone needs help with that, um, please contact the Fluvanna County Victim Witness Program at 434-591-1985. Uh, and more information can be found at uh, www.stalkingawareness.org. And uh, a little recognition for Parks and Rec. So uh, Parks and Rec was at the Virginia Fair Board's annual conference this year. The conference was held January 12th through the 15th at the Williamsburg Lodge. This was the first time that a representative of the Fluvanna County Fair has attended the conference. Uh, so Kirsten Kropp, uh, the Fair Board Vice President attended, representing the Fair Board, and, and Mr. Spitzer, um, Fluvanna Parks and Rec Director, uh, attended also. Um, also, the Fair Board, along with Fair Board liaisons Kim Mayo of the Fluvanna uh, Extension Office and Aaron Spitzer, one they wanted to, there were some different awards and categories for trying to get prizes um, and recognition for, for what they do. So they um, entered in some things for categories such as brochure, logo, poster, color, newspaper ad, radio advertisement, advertising, and fair booklet. So the, ver uh, the fair board plot place top three in two categories for newspaper ad ad color um, and logo. And they got the winning logo category. They got, I think they got first prize here for the winning logo category. So a special thanks goes out to Kim Mayo um, for organizing and putting the materials together that were entered and uh, kudos to the fair board and Parks and Rec for, for getting good recognition mm -hmm. to the county. And um, just some upcoming meeting dates that we have. So February 1, we have a 5 p.m. regular meeting. February 1 at 7 p.m. will be the county administrator's FY24 budget proposal and revenue expenditures brief. February 8 will be a 7 p.m. budget work session for constitutional officers. And then February 15th will be a 5 p.m. budget work session for the Fluvanna County Public Schools FY24 adopted budget presentation. And then at uh, 7 p.m. on the 15th, we'll have a regular meeting. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for our county administrator? If not, we have our first public comment section, um, five minutes. Now, we do have three public hearings. So if you are here to speak to the public hearings, we will have a time for you to do that. You, you wouldn't come up for this comment section. But if you, anything else that you would like to talk to the board about, you can come at this time, come to the podium, give your name and address, and you have five minutes to speak. Anything that's not about public hearing. Thank you. How do you do, Chief? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, I'm Rich Constantino. I'm the Fire Chief, Lake Monticello Fire Department. And I'd like to, first of all, congratulate the new uh, chair and vice Thank chair you. of the Board of Supervisors and wish you all the luck in the world. You can grieve me after this meeting. <laughs> and thank the outgoing yeah. chair yeah. and vice chair, Mr. Uh, Sheridan yeah. and Mr. O'Brien. It was suggested that I come down and speak to all to you folks tonight and invite you to attend a seminar this Saturday, the 21st at 9 a.m. at the Lake Marcello Firehouse, uh, where the county fire companies will be holding an in-depth seminar regarding lithium ion batteries, focusing on awareness, fire suppression, life safety issues, and obstacles we face every day. With the new and proposed solar farms, the battery energy storage systems and electric vehicles and school buses, there are many facets that not only the firefighters should be aware of, but the county staff as well. We also invited the TRC, and uh, the planning commission as well. There's a lot of incidents going around countrywide that have proven to be fatal, causing hundreds of injuries and substantial property damage due to lithium ion batteries. We will focus the uh, seminar on battery technology, behavior failure, and other many occurrences our firefighters will be exposed to. We will discuss the associated hazards, strategy and tactics and case studies. This technology is fairly new to the fire service and is problematic for the mitigation of incidents, especially electric vehicle and solar farms and the battery storage systems that they have there. 
So on behalf of all the firefighters in the county, I, I invite the board to be there Saturday morning, nine o'clock, and the joint will be about three hour seminars. And uh, thank you for your time, and hopefully we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I just want to add that yes. the, one of the reasons that I asked him to say this was a, so it was coming from his perspective as a fire chief and that there are some nasty things that people are dealing with associated with solar farms that uh, any board member that can go, I think, should be there. Uh, there's a lot we don't know yet. Yes. And I, then I'm, I'm assuming the board all the board got the email, correct? Got an email about that? No, I, 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 I did. I haven't. Okay. I haven't. Right, well, like I said, yeah. Chief Constantino forwarded something to me just this afternoon. So I, I'll forward the same thing to you all and just make sure you have it. Okay. But again, it's right. 9, 9 a.m. this Saturday. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Anyone else would like to come and speak to the board at this time? Not seeing anyone. I'll close the first. Keep so on. Online? Yeah. Text. No one? Thank you all for reminding me of that. I don't see anyone no. unmuting. Okay. Or make sure you stop me, Kelly, if I'm one of y'all, so we can make sure we have everyone. She's not sure you, she was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now yeah. we have. Oh, Did I hear cool. someone? Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, good Stay. evening. Uh, I my name is Elizabeth Vensel, and I'm late to the meeting. I'm wondering when you will take up the agenda item of um, Little Creek Road and the and the rezoning of uh, that property on Little it's, Creek Road. Yes, it's coming. That's next. the one. It was. That's the one. That's was, a ZMP twenty two zero four. That's yeah. yeah. That was moved for 60, that, um, sixty days. Um, yeah, that um, one was. That was deferred for 60 days. I think the board, once we have to get to it, I think the board has to take formal action, though, to, to yeah, to they defer. Requested a deferral. They okay. requested a deferral. So when do we do that? Once we come up to, once we come up to oh. item I. Okay. All right. I beg your pardon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we are going into our public hearing. If you picked up an agenda, your second page has the rules and procedures for public hearings. Um, I know you can read, but I would like to read this to you, please. Purpose. The purpose of a public hearing is to receive testimony from the public on certain resolution, ordinances, or amendments prior to taking action. A hearing is not a dialogue or debate. Its express purpose is to receive additional facts, comments, and opinions on subject items. Speakers. Speakers should approach the lectern so that they may be visible and audible to the board. Each speaker shall clearly state his, her name and address. All comments should be directed to the board. All questions should be directed to the chair. Members of the board are not expected to respond to questions and respond to questions should be made at the, at the chair's discretion. Speakers are encouraged to contact staff regarding unresolved concerns or to receive additional information. Speakers with questions are encouraged to call county staff prior to a public hearing. Speakers should be brief and avoid repetition of previously presented comments. Action. At the conclusion of the public hearing on each item, the chair will close the public hearing. The board will proceed with this deliberation and will act on a formally postponed action on such item prior to proceeding to other agenda items. Further public comments after the public hearing has been closed generally will not be permitted. If you are going to speak, you have we have a limit of five minutes. People who may be online, I don't know if you can hear, it's not a horn, it's not a ding dong, I don't know what it is, but it is a sound to let you know that the five minutes is up. If you're in the middle of a sentence, 
please finish that sentence. Um, or if it's a thought, but if it's a paragraph or two or three sentences, I may hit the gavel and kind of have you to uh, come to a closure so that we can move on. Thank you so much for your cooperation. Uh, the first uh, public hearing is the MP 2104. No, no I thought we got wrapped by that. Oh, we, got, we do, you're right. Okay. Thank you. No, um, 2204 Bond Property Group LLC, and this is the one that is deferred. Yeah, and it looks like the applicant come up if you need again. Uh, the applicant sent, sent, sent me a letter requesting okay. a re, uh, deferral of this one. And Mr. Bond, if you want to briefly speak on that, uh, yes, good evening, uh, Chairwoman, mm -hmm. Vice Chairman, uh, Board. Thank you guys for your time. I did send in a request earlier today, uh, to Mr. Dahl asking. Uh, to have uh, this application deferred. And the reasoning being is that uh, Gustavo, who's my engineer here from Bowman, was still waiting on the results from our water study delineation on the property to decide how the stream um, wetlands and potential floodplain is going to impact uh, the property. So that is the reason that we asked for the deferral. Okay. Now, do we have, can we question, is there any questions for Mr. Bond? Any questions, sure. anything? If not, we have a motion. Do we have some? I just have one question. Yes. Was that specifically involving the creek on the property? Correct. Okay. Because we need to get an understanding of what how how it impacts our building footprint, whether we can how much of a square footage we can put out. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Vaughn? I just, I just want to add clarity for the crowd. Yeah, That's sure. the property on the west yeah. side of 15. Okay. Thank you. And and just one thing, Mr. Mr. Vaughn had requested a 60 day deferral. Yes. Um, so mm -hmm. I would suggest that you that you specify the second meeting in March. Yep. OK. So that's not in the motion. No, because, no. again, this motion was was pre deferral. So, OK, um, I think once the board says and if Mr. Mr. Payne, correct me if I'm wrong, probably down to parcel one could they just read that and say defer and then add for 60 days to the second march, march meeting i think you could probably do it with i move the board of supervisors defer zmp 2204 until the second meeting in march march 13th okay uh, excuse me 15. all right do we have a motion uh i move the board of supervisors defer zmp 2204 uh request to amend blue Valley county zoning map to the second meeting in March, March 15th. All right, do we have second. a second? All right, we have a motion by Mrs. Sheridan and a second by Mrs. Eager. All in favor? Uh, uh, anyone opposed? Chair both sides. Thanks so much. Sheridan. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Vaughn. Okay. Our next uh, public hearing is for ZMP 22. 05 Bond Property Group LLC, Mr. Douglas Miles, Community Development Director. Do we have a sign up sheet with people who want to? Okay, the people just come and give the name. That's fine. We will manage. Okay, Ms. Miles. Hey, good evening to everyone. I'll be up here for a little bit with you for the next three public hearings. So, start off. Um, with um, ZMP 2205, and this is the east side of mm -hmm. uh, Route 15. Um, this is ZMP 2205, Vaughn Property Group LLC is a conditional rezoning request from the A1 um, Agricultural General to the I1 Industrial Limited District on 40 plus or minus acres of tax map um, 11, section nine, parcel two. Um, the subject property is located on the east line of um, Route 15 is approximately one mile uh, plus or minus south of the intersection of Route 15 and Route 250. and is located in the Zion Crossroads Community Planning Area in the Columbia Election District. So I think um, a good majority of folks are aware of where this is, but basically you're, um, you're just, just south of Zion Crossroads. Um, Little Creek Road is about where Troy Road is shown over there on the um, west side. And you're just north of um, Lake Road and where a um, majority of the community, I think, is here um, for this request. It's a closer version of it. Um, this is the 40 acre tract on your uh, east side of 15. See Lake Road, Jackson Road, just to, due to the south. Um, 
and uh, the surrounding properties, um, residential homes, and then uh, vacant property to the east and uh, north. So zoning map to let you kind of know everything in this general area <laughs> is currently zoned to A1, um, general agricultural. You'll see north, north central part of the slide, um, industrial and commercial zonings that are in the southern part of that Zion Crossroads area. Um, and then the next slide, we'll talk about a little more in detail. Um, this uh, uh, pink um, color that is shown in there is that is the actual Zion Crossroads urban development area. Um, and this parcel and the parcel that just was deferred to the west are both just inside of the Zion Crossroads area. I'll let everyone know basically this area of Flavana County has been established this way since the 2009 comprehensive plan um, for uh, the area to be rezoned and brought into um, commercial or industrial uses. Um, so this is the outer outer um, extent of that area. Um, and a lot of the uh, focus of, is upon um, uh, transportation or traffic concerns. Um, and there are consultants here tonight. They'll be able to answer some more detailed questions um, um, for you all. But um, Route 15 is is classified as a minor arterial road. You remember we changed it from a major collector road to a minor arterial last year. Um, has access to I-64. Um, EPR, the applicant's um, traffic consultant, did complete a study in uh, November 2nd. Um, some of the um, peak period times, I think the applicant and his consultants are going to go over that. But basically what it's telling you in their report um, is the left and right turn lanes are warranted for the site. Um, so a 300 foot northbound left turn lane with a 200 foot taper and a 100 foot southbound right turn lane with 200 foot taper. So um, what that's telling us is the traffic um, that that is inspected for development there, would they would be required to make those improvements at the time of site plan review um, for the request. Um, I'm gonna go over some of um, Mr. Vaughn's uh, proffers um, and in the packet you all, um, the illustrated exhibit that is shown as exhibit B would be the conceptual um, plan in nature and is shown consider as consideration for the rezoning request. This is the MP2205. Um, as I stated, the final site plan would establish the ultimate site layout and shall provide for safe and convenient vehicular circulation within the site. The planning staff, we work with in, in the site and then the VDOT, uh, Louisa residency folks work with um, anything out in the VDOT right away. So um, entering the site. Um, key here for what we've been working with you all at the planning commission and board level, um, the property shall be screened from view in substantial accordance with the illustrative exhibit um, submitted most recently of December 7th, uh, 2022, as prepared by Bowman Engineering, along with the requirements of uh, Section 2224-7, which is the screening and buffering requirements um, of the Flavana Zoning Ordinance. Um, and then on this side, this property, the developer will maintain a 60-foot vegetative buffer along the shared pro property boundaries. I'll let you know the ordinance only requires 25. So he's going great, much greater than what the ordinance requires um, in this request. Um, this is a new condition kind of that we've been using um, for, uh, if you remember the Wolfpack properties over on Lake Monticello Road, the VDOT approved construction entrance for the pro property, including primary ingress and egress. Printing logging operations shall be established from Route 15. Um, and the key here is if um, when they go to develop the site, the developer would notify VDOT and Flavana County prior to commencing any construction or logging activity. And that's really important for us because you can have um, uh, timbering and logging facility companies uh, that come from other parts of the state and just start doing work. And we want to be able to be notified prior to that so we can notify adjacent property owners and such. Uh, some of the um, excluded um, I-1 limited land use um, requirements that they've provided are there would be no flea markets, no self-storage facilities, uh, car washes, uh, and indoor shooting ranges as some of the commercial uses. Um, industrial use of solid waste collection facilities. They don't ever see the need for that. And then a temporary wood storage um, in, in the I-1 zoning. 
and, and Mr. Miles, just to confirm, that is those are proffers that they made to exclude those uses. Correct. Those uses would be excluded from all the other permitted I-1 uses. And as Mr. Dahl stated, we'll kind of give you a general idea of what some of the remaining uses are. Um, I-1 zoning by right, some of the commercial office uses uh, could be things as simple as a corporate office park, um, financial institutions, banks, machinery sales and service, um, medical clinics, parking facilities, professional schools, trade schools, um, and transportation terminals. Um, some of the um, I-1 industrial related ones are data centers, machine shops, light manufacturing of finished products, research um, laboratories. And a lot of times what you see in I-1 zoning in this area is wholesale warehouses and distribution centers. So um, those are those are some of the uses we're striving for short term because they're low volume water uses. So with the amount of water and sewer we have um, available. Um, this is the, um, the combined uh, location showing you um, the one on the west side has been deferred and the one that um, Mr. Dahl is circling is the one that's currently under the 2205 request. Um, and at this point, um, we can go over some of your minimum standards. Um, a lot of times, uh, I think in the past, um, we've taken an approach in the end of 2022 and going into 23, kind of educate the public, the planning commission and board um, relative to what some of our expectations are. These are the minimum caliper and height requirements that we're looking for. Uh, Mr. Fairtop, Chef Fairchild, if you remember, we went through a lot of this about this time last year with the Dominion substation over there on Roots and Lake Road um, with that, that request. So a lot of our um, landscaping materials we are going to look at for the developer to be to be placing these things um, in these, these type of requirements um, right away. Um, screening, so the, the what what has to be screened and why, where are they screening things from? Commercial and industrial uses shall be screened from the adjacent properties in residential and agricultural zoning districts. Um, parking lots, to include parking lots, um, shall be screened from public roads, rights of ways, and adjacent properties. And a lot of time that has to do with the lighting. Um, some of the lighting that you have um, in nowadays, um, we do have the shoebox directional downward type lighting in most cases, but the ambient lighting, the screening and um, that type of thing. Um, other objectionable features, um, she'll be screened from public roads, right of ways and adjacent properties. These are pretty standard. These are loading areas, refuse areas, storage yards, um, you know, um, dumpster enclosures, um, that, that kind of thing. Maintenance areas as they're building the facility. Um, we don't want to See all the welders hanging up in in uh, in the in the air, that kind of thing. Um, we want everything um, screened from view. Um, when required, there is different opportunities for folks to do. We encourage as much as possible natural vegetation to remain. If it's not going to be in the area where you're building the the new industrial buildings or the the use, please preserve it as much as you can. Existing vegetation. Um, then that gets you up to other types of things like uh, masonry walls, fences, um, combination thereof. And we work through the site plan process to get that set up. Um, the most uh, popular version is evergreen trees, the planting of um, two rows of evergreen trees. And I won't read all through this, but you can see it's quite dense. Um, uh, and then the mixed vegetation option that you're getting um, some additional landscaping options in. Um, and finding out uh, that you're able to screen and meet the requirements. Just uh, keep in mind that structural things such as actual buildings, walls, and fences um, can be used for site screening. So as buildings get constructed, they actually screen them, the additional loading areas and dumpster enclosures and things from the right of way from uh, Route 15 and what, ha what have you. Um, but uh, we also try to encourage as a contractor building a facility, that they actually um, utilize some of the uh, excess building materials. So if it's a, the building is brick and you put in a dumpster enclosure and you use some additional brick. So it kind of has a more architectural um, continuity throughout the project. And that's pretty much what I have for you all. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. 
Um, we would like to re remember, or let you know that this is fully in compliance with the comprehensive plan. The um, planning commission um, did recommend approval of this with the, um, at that time with the um, excluded uses proffers. And then between the planning commission and tonight, um, Mr. Vaughn did add the additional three other proffers to guarantee the layout and some of the other um, features. So happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Miles? We can come back to questions after public comment, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, because I believe that Mr. Vaughn is yeah. going to have yes. a little bit more information right. and some of his uh, civil engineers and mm -hmm. traffic engineers are here. To okay, thank questions. you, Mr. Miles. And now we will have Mr. Vaughn to come with his presentation. Yep. Good evening again. Thank you so much for taking time to meet with us. Uh, my name is John Vaughn. I'm the owner of Vaughn Property Group, and I'm here today with my partner, Justin Braden, Greg Nosar, and we have our consultants from Bowman, Mr. Gustavo, uh, who will be able to answer any questions as it pertains to the actual site, and our traffic uh, consultant, Ms. Jenny Alexander, uh, who will be able to answer any questions um, in regards to the actual traffic numbers and, and things of that. So, um, well, obviously, we're here today to discuss um, our proposal um, for Zion. We're titling Zion Crossroads number two. Go to the next slide, uh, Eric. That'd be great. Uh, the next one. Um, what we're proposing is a rezoning for light industrial for the intended use of a uh, distribution center. Um, one of the, the the main concerns or main agendas that we had talking to you know with the planning commission and also uh residents was the importance of maintaining that rural feel not turning this into northern virginia ashburn where you're seeing all of these buildings once at every stoplight so when we found out what the minimum uh, uh vegetation uh buffering was at 25 feet um, one of the easiest things that we could uh do initially was to increase that double uh almost double we got to 40 feet of uh, coverage. And then at the uh, planning commission, it was recommended uh, by the um, by the uh, planning board that, you know, we increase that even more, which is why now you'll see when we get to the site plan that we've increased it to 60 feet um, on the parts of uh, the site that border uh, the residential homes. Uh, you can go to the next one. And here uh, is the uh, site that is not deferred, the site here on the east side. And if, if you see along the southern portion of the site, that is where we increase the buffering from 25 to 40 to ultimately uh, 60 feet from the property line of, of the adjacent properties um, as well. And as, as well, in the beginning, we initially had a footprint of buildings that were about 200,000 square feet almost. Um, and working with Gustavo and Bowman, understand the importance of you know, trying to create as much of a buffer as possible um, we shrunk the footprint of the buildings, which, you know, by county standards, technically we could use about 80% of the parcel for a build out. And with this conceptual plan right here, we're using only about 35% of that. So we've really tried to make a conscious effort um, to make sure that the buffering of the site um, is doesn't disturb any of the uh, adjacent owners uh, whatsoever. Um, what you also see here, uh, as we do have our traffic uh, generation study that uh, uh, Jenny over at EPR did for us. And I have to preference um, uh, my preference anything by saying we were tasked um, by the county to provide um, the highest and most extreme uh, traffic count use possible, uh, you know, with the study, which is why uh, you see the numbers uh, so elevated uh, the way they are. But as we get further into it, um, the description, you'll see um, that we have one there, a comparable of the Walmart distribution center over there um, in Louisa County and comparing the size of their site, which is double the size here. Um, they're at 800, over 800,000 square feet. Um, their actual peak hour trip numbers are significantly lower um, than the generation study that we did. And that would be something that uh, Jenny can touch on to get uh, dive further into a little later on. Um, and you know the Walmart, as you see, as you'll see on the on the um, on the PowerPoint, the Walmart peak hours uh, for traffic in the morning. They're at 200 total vehicles, not just trucks, but total vehicles, including um, employees as well. And they also have two separate entrances, so those are two entrances combined. 
And then the PM uh, traffic peak, they have 172 total vehicles. Um, in comparison to what our generation study um, spit out was, you know, 333 total in the morning peak hours and 293 total in the PM uh, PM time frame. Um, and those numbers alone are significantly higher uh, than the Walmart numbers for a site that's half its size. So we feel extremely confident that those overall trip numbers in the peak hours of the morning and the uh, and the evening will be significantly lower. Uh, we can go to the next slide, sir. Thank you. As uh, Mr. Miles um, commented on earlier, the excluded uses are flea markets, self-storage facilities, car washes, shooting range, solid waste processing facilities, you know, the biochemical stuff, clubs, all of that things, those are not um, things that we're, uh, our intended uses for the site. We're strictly uh, focused on uh, distribution uh, for this site. Let me go to the next. Um, just, a, just an overview um, in terms of um, the square footage for the site, uh, we have a maximum of 435,000 square feet, uh, which currently on our concept plan, uh, shows in three buildings at 130, 145,000 square feet per building. Um, going back to the, the rural field, uh, in terms of the entire site, we have 50 plus uh, mature foliage buffers in there and the 50 feet comes along Route 15. So the 50 foot buffer along Route 15, the 60 foot buffer um, along where the adjacent properties um, are to the site. Um, and what that's going to allow us to do is we're going to keep as much as the natural vegetation there as possible. So all of those tall trees should provide um, and, uh, for a low building, not just the footprint, but also low visibility uh, of the building, um, especially during the time when there are leaves and everything uh, on the tree. In terms of the jobs that it will create, um, all of our studies have shown that distribution and warehouses um, tend to uh, average out at, you know, add an additional 100, 200 jobs um, for a site like this, which would have a trickle down effect to uh, the other businesses that could be coming to uh, Flubana County as well, because, you know, those workers are going to be looking for places to eat for lunch, you know, gas stations, places to shop, grocery stores, and things of that nature. Um, and then obviously the additional county benefits would just be the competitive increased tax income uh, to provide more um, economic value uh, for the county. That is it. And if there are no immediate questions for me right now, that's all we have. Again, when we get to the questions portion, we do have um, our two consultants here uh, to answer any questions that you guys may have. Thank you so much for your time. Any board members have any questions for Mr. Vaughn? Right now. I'll wait. Anyone? I'll wait. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, now we are going to um, open the public hearing. Please keep your comments to five minutes on topic and direct it to the board. Who would like to be first? Come right on, Miss. Give your name and address. Miss Booker. Yes. Can I make a suggestion? Yes. The next person could come move down, closer. Could go, come down and move closer. Just, yes. Just for the sake of time, folks. Good. Good suggestion, Miss Sheridan. Anyone else? Move closer. Thank you. You. Okay, my name is Sherry Bowie. I live at 721 Lake Road, which is in the Hunters Lake subdivision, which is immediately adjacent to this property. Can you all hear her? Can everyone hear? Yeah, that did not work. Yeah, I, I, it's okay. It's not, I couldn't. If I did that, it fell over. Uh, Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's much, much better. Okay. Uh, those of you that didn't hear me before, I'm Sherry Bowie. I live in Hunters Lake, which is adjacent to this property. Um, we have a number of issues with this proposal, mostly concerning traffic. Our neighborhood is a small rural 10 acre minimum lot. We have a school run by Open Door Church. We have a daycare center run by open door church and we have 40 lots with people that are trying to get in and out and we are very concerned about how the traffic flow is going to be affected by all these trucks and employees coming in and out and their impact on the flow through traffic from people trying to get to work and we've looked at the studies that they were required to do and while 
they're talking about the numbers being worst case scenario and comparing it to the Walmart site. One of the issues we have with that comparison with the Walmart site is that we have a lot of flow through traffic coming up from the south that is going up to 250 or 64 to go to jobs in either east or west. And the flow through from the northern half that goes through Walmart is a much smaller number. So I don't think we're really doing a quite apples to apples comparison, which concerns us a lot because we'd like to be able to safely get in and out of our neighborhood. We have a lot of dips in the road coming from the south, and we're very concerned that people coming up at a 55 mile an hour speed, you have trucks coming southbound trying to turn right, uh, I'm sorry, left into this site, and that we're going to have crashes and we're not going to be able to get out of the neighborhood. And and that is extremely concerning to us. And when you look at the numbers, you're talking about a large number of people, particularly in the morning and evening rush, just the employees alone, not counting the trucks. And we're worried about how on earth we're going to be able to get out of our neighborhood safely and to get the school children in and out and the daycare facility taken care of. Um, so that's problem number one. Problem number two. We still don't know what how many days of the week this is going to be impacting us. Is it a five hour, a five day, or a seven day a week operation? Do we get a respite over the weekends from whatever is going up there and what noise is going on? Because I mean, we are rural. We like the quiet, and we'd like to keep it fairly quiet. I know they're planning on doing as much noise mitigation as they can, but you think about semis backing up; those beepers are horrifying and very loud. Um, thirdly, this is an issue that the board we would hope would consider in the future. I know the regs only require that abutting property, properties be informed of projects coming up. So only six people were informed of this proposal and we started hearing about it at the last minute. And then Mr. Vaughn contacted a lot more of us, but it should be a larger area that is informed of this. I mean, we're impacted, but we're more, we're not abutting it. We're the next properties down from the few property owners that are right at the top of our subdivision that touch this, but we're all impacted. And I think the board should seriously consider requiring a broader contact with people in the area. Um, another issue that's board associated, we didn't find out about this property potential rezoning until after our reassessment notices are received and the time for protesting them was closed. And with a 14 to 22 percent increase in our property values, I can't imagine this is going to increase our property values. And we're really annoyed and upset because we get so few services from the county as it is. We're a private road, although I think we are covered by the grandfathering provisions that the county has for taking over uh, our roads from what I have read in the past and discussed with members of the county government. But we maintain our own roads. We maintain the um, piping under the roads. We do all our snow plowing. So we have no cost to you for any maintenance of our neighborhood. We also have no regular police patrol in there. So we don't take much in the way of county services and we don't have a lot of children. So we're not impacting the uh, school system very much as to cost to the county. Um, is that a that's phone call? Or is, that's the no, phone that's the line. Line. Oh, yeah. She's, she just sets her phone. Huh. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, then I will quit with that and I will turn this over to somebody else because there's Thank another you. issue we're very concerned Thank about. You Thank so you so much. Next person, please. My name is Jim Snyder and um, I live at 58. Creek Road, and that's um, in Hunters Lake as well. Uh, I just want to go over a couple of the Fluvanna County Code ordinances. I'm sure you're all familiar with them and how if this is zoned industrial and it's just not if, if they take it over because if it's in zone industrial and they drop out, it's still zoned industrial. And there's a whole lot of other things that you guys could then approve to come in. Um, in the chapter 15, the noise ordinance, the Board of Supervisors hereby finds and declares that excessive or unwanted sound is a serious hazard to the public health, safety, welfare, and quality of life 
and that the inhabitants of the county have a right to and should be free from an environment of excessive and unwanted sound. It goes on to exclude um, a bunch of things, which would be industrial sounds. As Sherry brought up, the beeping sounds of, of backing up trucks, the diesel trucks and all. Right now, we don't have to worry about it, but if this is rezoned, it's going to really impact our community, the health of us, the our, our quietness um, in section 15, one through five, it, it goes on and talks about unreasonable, unreasonably disturbs or annoys the quiet comfort and repose of any person is hereby prohibited. So if this goes to industrial, you know, that kind of really impacts us. Um, in chapter two, uh, chapter 22 of the zoning, uh, a lot of the things that um, was brought up that are beneficial in your zoning thing, um, you know, do imply. But there are some things in here that are, are the purposes of rezoning that would be negative um, to the community. And um, this chapter, together with the accompanying map, is adopted for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, or general welfare of the public. Again, some of them are beneficial. Um, number two, to reduce or prevent congestion in the public streets. Well, this is not gonna reduce or prevent congestion in the public streets. It's gonna increase it as they've already stated. How, how much, we're not sure. Number six, to protect against one or more of the following, danger and congestion in travel and transportation. Again, it's gonna increase that. Sherry brought that up, our concerns as well. Number eight, to provide for the preservation of agricultural and forest, forestal lands and other lands of significance for the protection of the natural environment. Well, this is gonna destroy it. Right now, it's all hardwood, and and if they think that hardwoods is a is a buffer, right now you can see a long ways into into hardwood. So you're going to be able to see this, hear it, and um, you know, and destroy the natural environment. It's already zoned agricultural, so why make it industrial when this is part of this um um zoning portion? So. Um, I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And, and I appreciate your service. I'm on the board at Hunter's Lake, and I know it's not an easy job. I, well, thank you. you know, so I, I appreciate Next it. Next person, please. I didn't get up and stand because I can see I'm limping. Um, my name is Loretta Johnson Morgan, and um, I live at 18 Lake Road, Troy, Virginia. I'm at the end of the road, or at the top of the road of Lake Road. And um, I've been listening to a lot of community meetings. I've been looking on all this documentation, and I still have some questions in regards to setbacks, easements on um, Route 15. Um, I've been on the county site, and I can't really find the answers, and I'm just trying to figure out where it is. But there's supposed to be a hundred feet setback on Route 15 to build this building. Within that hundred feet setback, there are electrical poles. Um, there's a clearing of debris. Um, so I'm trying to figure out where the greenery is actually gonna go. Um, the proposed diagram that I see has some gray areas surrounding the buildings and look like they flew right into the setback area. Is that allowed? Is that what the county is doing? Um, they're talking about putting a 60 foot buffer is that 60 foot buffer within the 100 foot setback or is it past it? There's no clarification at all that I can see where this is. And if the buffer is past the 60, I mean the 100 feet setback, is that like 160 feet now? Or is it again within the 60 feet? There's no clarification. When you're putting in turning lanes on both sides, the average turning lanes, you know, it's about 10 feet wide on both sides of the road. So does that setback push the buildings either further back? <coughs> because once you put their turning lane in, it still becomes part of Route 15. 
I can't see where any of those questions are answers. So I'm just trying to figure out what in the world the county is trying to do and why these questions haven't been asked. Are you gonna move the electrical power poles? I hope not, because that's gonna disrupt our whole community up there. There's plenty of roads, there's hills, humps, everything. How are you gonna put anything on these diagrams? It shows the straight stretch. Route 15 is not a straight stretch. So where are these trucks going to actually go? Those are my questions. Um, the other question I have is, um, what about the, the strings on the other side? I know you guys deferred it, but I'm still going to bring it up. From when I looked at the diagram, it looks like the stream on the west side goes right under the buildings. But isn't it true that you can't disturb the flow of water? So how can they go under those buildings? Those are questions I have. So these are just some of the things that I'm trying to figure out from the diagrams and the conversations of what's going on in the county, because I know on numerous occasions, I as a homeowner have been subject to setbacks put by the county, sometimes two different set of setbacks. One planning per person tells me one thing, and then the next planning person tells me something else. You know, and all of this was in regards to me simply trying to put basic storage um, units or little sheds on my property. I had one that was approved by the county um, planning commission. I had permit approved. And then I tried to put another one by, right beside it. And then they tell me, you're in violation with the original one you have. And I was like, how is that when you all approved the permit? So I can't find any documentation on the county site about anything about setbacks easements and so forth. And I think that needs to be looked at when we're building these warehouses on 15. And I hope that the county would do some research in there before they approve this project, because I don't see where they're following the setbacks or the easements. So those are my questions and concerns. Again, um, you all have already heard my original concerns because I put those concerns out last month, month before, at a previous Board of Supervisors meetings. And I agree with everything that my neighbors are saying. So all I'm asking is that you all look more into the setbacks and the easement and how it's going to affect our neighborhood up on Route 15. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Thank you, Ms. Moore. Next. Are you coming up, Chris? Yes, ma'am. Oh, OK. Walking slow, but I'm bringing them. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Chris Morgan. Uh, Loretta's my wife. She's very lucky. Uh, <laughs> amen. I've said it a thousand times. Great. <laughs> she, <laughs> she moved pretty quick just then. <laughs> but uh, I would just like to tell the board that I'm more concerned about the traffic once again. Um, I don't. I think this young lady does the traffic study for them. If I think you are a member of the fire department, aren't you? If you're driving one of those fire trucks, their diagram shows a straight line. And if you if you go up that area, you got dips. I'm so worried that the fire trucks are not going to be able to stop. Once he comes over that dip, if a truck is pulling out, car is slowing down, he cannot stop. The uh, police officers, if they go into a call, and they go by a house sometimes wide open, legally. You know, they're not violating the law. They got the sirens and the blue lights on. They're not gonna stop. Uh, the rescue squad, they go by. Sometimes they got someone in there. They need to get up very fast to the Zion's Crossroad, to the helipad. They're not gonna stop. So they either gotta go in a ditch or they gotta rear in somebody. So you really need to take that into consideration. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, lucky man. <laughs> I Next. think you're both lucky with yeah. Sasha. Next speaker. <laughs> My name is Brian Barth. I live 520 Creek Road. Uh, I've been to the meetings that we've had, community meetings and stuff. Another concern we have as a community is the uh, runoff. I know they're uh, required to make the runoff go into a pond and all that and stuff, but uh, if any of that stuff would happen to fail and come into our section, then our roads would be, our pipes would be blown out and there's only one way in, one way out, so we would be stuck in there also. 
So that's just another concern we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. Anyone else? Yes. Online, yes. Yes. Okay. State your name and address. You have five minutes. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Venzel, V-E-N-C-I-L-L. -L. My address is 4504 Bluff Creek Drive, Modesto, California. My trust is the owner of 12 and a half acres on Little Creek Road, just above the property that Mr. Vaughn wants to develop on the, on the west side of the creek. I believe that was the one that was deferred today. I want to let you all know that I'm going to use that property as a for a conservation easement because of the water that runs through it into the James River watershed on into the Chesapeake Bay. I'm very disappointed to learn that the property below mine, which collects the water in a pond in a marshy area, might be developed into something that is gonna be undermined by the water that flows down there naturally. I'm um, broken hearted that this rural property is gonna suffer such, um, such an assault on its beauty. The hills with the hardwoods are so incredible. Having watched the Paradise Fire and the campfire and the fires in California, losing any kind of trees at all for any reason at all, it just breaks my heart. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to persuade the board to not allow development on the Little Creek Road portion on the east side of uh, 15 for that reason. There are deer and possum and vultures and creatures of the forest that live in that little tiny parcel of 12 and a half acres that's just incredibly pristine and beautiful. And I think that too often we're cavalier about the beauty that surrounds us. And that's all I have to say. And um, Please don't approve this change. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Do we have we have a hand there, up? A hand up, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair. Online. Looks like Miss Ward. Katie Ward. Hi. Good evening. Yes, I'm Katie Ward. I live at two four nine Buck Ridge Road in Troy, Virginia. Um, I don't live immediately next to this parcel, but I wanted to voice my concerns in support of my neighbors in Science Crossroads. Um, as it's clearly from what they're saying, they don't want it next to them and next door. Um, and even someone as, like me, I'm not going to be impacted immediately by this parcel being rezoned, but I still travel down Route 15 and up 250 to go to work, to take my dogs to the vet in Fork Union, drop off donations at the SPCA. And I can't imagine driving down that road and seeing although it might have buffer, seeing this kind of distribution center and that far from the heart of Zion's Crossroads. Um, you know, and the people that are most impacted or will be most impacted by this are telling you their concerns and their desire to not have this industrial zoning right next to them. And I really hope you listen, especially, I don't know that the one map that was brought up, um, you know, it was very scary for me to see that all around this parcel, it's zoned A1, all around it, immediately around it. Yet we're even having this conversation to even consider rezoning it to I1 when the closest I1 parcel, while perhaps this parcel is in the urban planning area, that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to go from one extreme to the other, from agricultural to industrial. There's a couple other phases and rezonings in between, I believe, like residential and that kind of thing. Um, and speaking as someone who has been impacted 
in the recent years from the rezoning of an A1 to an I2 with the Cosner property in 2017, which a few of you uh, voted to rezone that, even though there's not currently a business operating there, everyone that lives around this Buck Ridge Road, Blue Ridge Drive, we are still being impacted because there's been traffic impacts from this water line that still doesn't have water running through it. Our end of our road, a Blue Ridge Drive was closed and had some VDOT stuff working on it. And there's this half turn lane that I don't even know why it's there going into work. I'm impacted because the fire hydrants were being put in. So it's, it's even, <laughs> let's just say it's going to impact these people more than they realize to get the, the site work done. Um, this is your chance, supervisors, to listen to your constituents, where I feel like you didn't perhaps listen to the folks, the many folks in our case with the Cosner property, they were asking you not to rezone it from A1 to I2. This is your chance to listen to these people. Um, I don't know if anybody else noticed this, but the gentleman that spoke, no disrespect, but he couldn't even pronounce the name of our county correctly. And, you know, I don't know where he's from, but there's this desire to bring in this industry with the people that have made this county their home and love this county and are proud to be Fluvanna County residents are asking you not to rezone this. So I just hope that all the collective voices of the people that are most impacted by this will speak louder to you tonight as you deliberate for this parcel, for the one that might be deferred for weeks from now, please listen to what your constituents are asking and I hope it speaks louder than anyone's desire to sell their land. I don't know if this is under contract pending this rezoning or what, but just because someone's wanting to come in here and bring industry doesn't mean you have to approve it. You can let these people still have their rural life that they moved here for. We all move here to have the quiet. And just because we live at Zion's doesn't mean we want all this industry that's coming there. So don't bring it to an area that's already agricultural, predominantly agricultural. Um, I do thank you for your consideration and letting us uh, speak and letting it be a Zoom. Also, this is really convenient for those of us that work full time and can't get back and forth um, within the, the time frame. So thank you. And I just ask that you please listen to your constituents tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We have do we have anyone else who would like to speak? Uh, there's okay. like someone you're raising. Anybody right? else online? There's yes, about yeah. 310. Yeah. Moss. Mark Mosier. Mark Mosier. Uh, you're mute. Mu he's muted. He has to unmute himself, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Would, would you unmute yourself? Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Now. My name is Mark Mosier. I live at uh, 349 Hayden Road in the Hunters Lake uh, subdivision. And um, I would like to um, uh, be a little more specific about the traffic um, uh, to point out how uh, potentially dangerous uh, the left turn of the trucks from 15 during rush hour interrupting the northbound flow on 15 could be. At present, the uh, study that was submitted by, by uh, Mr. Vaughan uh, shows that 289 vehicles will be turning left into Zion Crossroads 2, the east side development, during the morning rush hour. And uh, the study estimates that 80% of these vehicles are trucks. So that's an average of 3.85 trucks per minute or one truck every 16 seconds, um, trying to interrupt the northbound rush hour flow of traffic. So um, due to the undulation on Route 15, um, and due to that uh, almost uninterrupted flow in the morning of people going to work on 15 northbound, I feel that the deceleration lane uh, for the left turn, for the eastbound turn on 15 south, is going to be clogged by these semis. And as soon as a semi finds a slot, he's going to go in there. The temptation will be be strong for the next guy to try and squeeze in. And the inevitable is that there's going to be, you know, heartbreaking or 
perhaps worse collisions from the northbound traffic uh, trying to um, get past these, uh, these trucks. And the same thing is going to happen in, in reverse um, on the, uh, uh, during the southbound, the uh, uh, evening rush hour. But the most uh, important one will be on the uh, on the the uh, northbound uh, uh, the the uh, morning rush hour, and th that's not even in taking into consideration the possibility that um, there is going to be traffic between the two sides if and when the west um, uh, traffic the, the west uh, Zion Crossroads uh, one is uh, developed. That's all I have. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else who would like to speak online or in the audience? Madam Chair, I don't I don't see anyone else online <laughs> muting or raising their hands. No one else? I do not. Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing at this time and bring it to the board for him to speak. Board members? And if you want to, I, I can bring up the site layout if that helps the board okay. instead of seeing this. I'm not sure, I'll, I'll just show you. Oops, oh, yeah. I don't know if that helps to see the board or. Okay, and, and we've, and we've heard a lot about, you know, traffic and turning and noise and um, disrupting the environment and different topics. So if any of you all would like to speak on what you've heard and- I'd like to hear from comment. traffic engineer. Uh, okay, traffic director, engineer. Please. Some of the numbers and, and concerns, traffic counts. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. I am Jeannie Alexander with EPR, and I am a traffic engineer. That's why I'm here, as you all know. Um, it might be helpful. Can you pull up that table? Yep, I can do that. Um, it's probably the best starting point. Yeah, there it is. So originally, we were tasked with looking at the trip generation for this site based on the most conservative assumptions. That is what that top line of this table is. And there you can see daily numbers, peak hour numbers. So that's one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon, in and out. That light industrial line is the most conservative assumption. With good reason. I expect that staff always wants to see the most conservative assumption out there looking at uh, various types of projects. What I would like you to focus on is that this is not the most appropriate assumption for this project. Um, the Walmart example has been cited, and actually those numbers at the bottom of the side, slide, those are for a three-hour period, where the numbers in this table, those AM and PMP, those are one-hour numbers. So it shows you a, the huge contrast in what is actually seen on a local site for a similar type facility of a much larger size. So really, that top, those numbers on that top line are very conservative. On the flip side of that, I would say that data center line at the bottom also not appropriate. It's somewhere in between those two. That is much more appropriate what this site will likely generate as far as the trips. Um, some other questions that came up from the public um, to talk about, unless you have some specific questions on these numbers in this table. Can, can you go back down to the, okay, thank you. And those numbers came from the Zion Crossroads small area plan. Thanks. And that, that's trucks and vehicles. Yes. Not just trucks. All of this includes total vehicles. Total yeah. Is there any, any sense of what the breakdown in terms of trucks versus vehicles would be? I mean, I, I would think also that there's capacity limitations. I mean, it would be hard for me to imagine 200 trucks turning into that location. I, th I think that's safe to say there are capacity limitations. I can't speculate on what that percentage is. What I can tell you, though, is thinking of some of the specifics of the site design and, for example, the turn lanes that have come up, the left turn lane and the right turn lane, 
when those are designed, the percentage of trucks, the highest assumption we can make on those is what we use to avoid the potential issue that came up of that turn lane not being long enough to accommodate the number of trucks and the amount of traffic expected. There are very specific criteria developed by VDOT um, that say, based on this amount of traffic, this speed, this truck percentage, this is the length that you should build this to. Well, uh, the other thing is what kind of trucks are we talking about? Are we talking about 18 wheelers? Are we talking about dump trucks? Um, a variety of those. Uh, what are Vans. Vans. Um, you don't, we don't know what the center is going to be doing. It could be all vans. Um, but we, we use the word truck. And when I think of a truck, I think of an 18-wheeler or a lumber truck. Um, but you, that's no answer, I don't think, to that. I can't speculate yeah, on I know. The, the mix of yeah, that. Yeah, probably be a mix. But what I would also state, too, that you know, based on this process, is this is the first step in the process. Many yeah, of those details know. get right. sorted out at the site plan level yeah. when more details are known about sure. the use. Yeah. yeah, and I understand that. Okay. Um, Here's my question for you. Now, I know VDOT is ultimately in control of everything that happens there. But going back to some of their consistent worries, it is some roller coaster hills up there. So we don't see those shown as to where your entrance is going to be. Is the plan to take those out and flatten it so that you do have a line of sight, a greater line of sight? So I can't say that those hills will be flattened out in the section of roadway. That's quite an undertaking. undertaking. But what VDOT does require is a minimum sight distance, which is based on the speed limit of the roadway primarily, and that that distance has to be met based on where that driveway is. And that's where Gustavo would adjust the site entrance placement to make sure that is met with the specifics of the terrain known and part of the design. And, and I know that there has been a comment about changing the speed it is 55 miles. Of course, people go 60 and 65. <laughs> Uh, that may help, may not. We not think about changing speed limit. Changing yes. speed limits is a, a tricky thing. <laughs> I know. So the, the one thing I will say is less than a mile south of this, or I'd say about a mile and a quarter, is a bad line of sight intersection <laughs> that we are trying to deal with VDOT to get corrected now. And I would hate to create something else like that if you ever drive up by the post office if you're driving south when you're coming out and we talk to them all the time oh, yeah that's the thing i'm saying that i really want to avoid where where is the entrance put the map up um mm, yeah. how far is the entrance from is, is, it, is, say, the is the actual entrance though set in stone yet I don't think so. Um, I think they pointed it. I think, I don't think Mr. So. Vaughn, I thought you pointed out one time where the yeah, entrance. They're, they're showing yeah. the, uh, the concept plan here uh, in between the last two buildings. Eric, if you can take your mouse and. So it's concept yeah. or it's actual? No, it's a concept plan. We That's what I'm saying. We don't know yet. Right, yeah. right. There's, there's, the answer is that we don't know. Correct. Right. V-Dodge will dictate. Yeah, or where that entrance is. Be that sites site distance is going to potentially dictate where that entrance right. has to go. Correct. Yeah, and if you look at those entrances right there, um, you know, and then and, and Mr. Mosier, I think, made some good points about left turns and so on. Um, I would assume a lot of the traffic is going to come from 64, come on to uh, 15, and then exit back on to 64 if you're looking at that perspective. Uh, if you if you look at the east side, then you don't have that that right turn into the traffic lane from that standpoint. If you look at the west side, that becomes a lot more problematic at that point in time. So I'm not really sure how how if when we come down to look at the west side, how that is really going to play out. If you're just going to have kind of that road there because your traffic is going to have to cross 15. To get into that facility right there and so that's a location where you expect to see a roundabout you know if if that's going to be a serious growth amount there 
So that, that that's not a concern to me on the east side, but is a concern to me on the west side for sure. But on the east side, in the morning, trucks coming from 64 will be coming into the turning lane and turning into there as all the traffic is heading out to Zion's mm -hmm. Crossroads mm -hmm. on yeah. 15 North. Oh, you're right. Yeah. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I got that backwards in my yeah. head, yeah. Yeah, we will have that coming that way. Can we think west of any side. other questions that were? It's, it's actually to... the west side that's easier, right? Yeah, to your point, the west side is easier. Well, well, they're they're... In, and they're coming out and they're gonna go on the other lane, right? The, the, the clear answer is that those hills will not be going away. No. Um, the um and you know if if we think back to village gardens and that entrance into village gardens that created so much concern and um vdoc was that was going to clear vdoc um that was a, still of notable concern to us as a board and letting village gardens come in down near nahor and so I do hear some of those concerns. I don't know that I, I, clearly VDOT isn't always um, going to be in the same spot as I or or we are regarding concern of an entrance or exit on a on a highway. And it is a good point that um, well, if you pop over those hills and that's rush hour traffic in the morning, um, just because VDOT allowed it and it's industrial so you can assume that a large portion of these vehicles are going to be trucks um and they're going to be crossing over that road as was said you know waiting for that break okay now it's now i gotta go but you don't move a semi quickly and um i, I i'm i'm wondering about the impact on trap even without the safety aspect of it just the impact on traffic alone coming through there, if you were at 7.30 in the morning to try to pass a car on that straight stretch going in Designs Crossroads, um, where that passing zone is. Is it a passing zone there? It, it's a passing zone, but that's that's all. You've got a line of sight there. Yeah. All I'm saying is if you were trying to pass in, in the morning with that rush hour, I mean, there's a long line of cars. I'm saying it, you might have a a time just passing there it's it's pretty congested um at if time. you put in turn lanes i imagine the passing zones will disappear would right. be my yeah. guess right yeah yeah right yeah but, but well, is, is that um in that stretch the passing zone is a little north of that i think it's not much it, no. it's the shepherd lane i think i think it's around shepherd lane yeah but i think shepherd lane is right there to the right yeah yeah that's true well, I, I think it's also maybe a little, I mean, yes, I can see 200 cars if you've got employees coming in. I mean, you've got three large buildings here. You could easily have several hundred employees. I think the idea that we're going to have, and this is where it'd be nice to understand the traffic that's happening around Walmart, but they're going to have 60, 70 trucks showing up at nine o'clock in the morning, you know, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, all trying to turn in is probably not correct. You know, that. That kind of traffic is going to flow throughout the day, and, and so you know that those traffic numbers are are difficult to kind of grasp from that standpoint because they don't tell that story. Of, you know what is kind of the average flow? Well, you know truckers wake up in the morning at seven o'clock, get their load, you know start driving to their destination, end up at their destination sometime around two or three. I'm not a trucker, so I'm just I'm, I'm being I'm hypothesizing here. But my guess is that a lot of truck traffic actually happens throughout the course of the day uh, and not necessarily in those morning rush hours. And I guess as a traffic engineer, and I, I know that you can't speculate, but is that is 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 that sort of the norm for traffic flow for what light industrial light warehousing or I, I think it's a reasonable assumption for all of us that if we have the choice to avoid the most congested period, we avoid it. Mm -hmm. Could, yeah, you but, repeat, but I, I, could you repeat yeah. that a oh, sure. louder, please? Sorry. Mm -hmm. I think it's safe to assume that for all of us, whether we're driving cars or trucks, that if we can avoid the most congested time of day to drive, we do. So to the extent that there's the flexibility there, yes, I think that's a safe assumption. But but isn't that isn't this built off of somewhat industry standards? In other words, 
somebody didn't just go, oh, we're going to say that they'll come in the morning and they'll come in the evening. So yeah, people, if they had a choice, the, the reality is the trucking industry doesn't so often have a choice and, and people coming to work um, aren't, uh, yeah, there's industry standards that those numbers are built off of. Right. Those, those numbers in that table are based on studies done throughout the country at various sites um, at, of different sizes. And also, they also vary in their use. Um, they're the closest industry standard to approximate what we expect right. traffic will be. So it is, no. so to, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. So it is to what you expect. It, yes. Within some limitations, I do think having a local um, example is more valuable than the nationwide statistics. So there's no granularity to those numbers. It's like when you go to the charts, it just says you've got two, you know, count of X amount. Yeah, there's, you can read a description that gives some general information um, about the years the studies cover um, parts of the country. And that's part of what our job is, is to go through those and make sure that they're relevant, yeah. that there, there wasn't just one study done at some obscure location of a, a totally different size. So that's part of what yeah, we I, do. I drive, you know, I don't drive, I don't commute on 15, you know, with any regularity. So, but I've never really heard people say, oh yeah, trying to get, you know, past the Walmart distribution center, you know, every morning is just a huge hassle. And I'm, I, it could be, I don't know. I'm just asking, you know, it, 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 you know, if that's what yeah. people are hearing out there um, because, you know, on the one hand, our constituents do say to us, you know, we want you to attract industry and business and we want to have jobs here and we want to have uh, diversification in our, uh, in our tax base. You know, on the other hand, they say, but we're concerned about all these other things and those are relevant. Uh, if those 230, 230 cars coming in are 200 jobs, well, you know, that is something that we're also trying to accomplish as well, right? You know, if it's 200 trucks, then there's some real other concerns there, right? Mm -hmm. The the uh, back to the Walmart comparison. So I, I must be getting lost in something. So the even if you lower the numbers a little bit, it's it's still within the range, just on the east side, of where Walmart is, right? If mm -hmm. 293, uh, I'm sorry, Eric, if you just go back up, go back up, 290. Uh, if, if, let's say it's light industrial, um, 293 in 252. Uh, let's or let's just say 293 in 252 out or in the PM or or if you go down to Walmart, wasn't that down um, down the slide? Yes, down here. Next slide, down yeah. right there. Yeah, the three so, hour time frame. That's Compared to a one hour time frame, their study is a one hour time frame, and this is over three hours actual count. The Walmart, Walmart's six to nine a.m. So instead of three hours, 200, it's actually closer to 60 or six, seven, seven during that hour. Well, we all go up to Walmart and we know what the traffic's like there, and for all the other businesses that have come. It's not that bad. Um, and they're also planning to uh, spend a hundred million dollars on keeping that road moving with Putting traffic bouts. circles. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'm pretty impressed that when we go to Walmart, it's that easy. Yeah. yeah they're, they're, they're talking about putting in the bow tie. Oh, they are? Yeah. Oh. Okay. From a divergent but I'm into a bow tie. So, so what's the time period for the AM? Up here? Yeah. One hour. In this in Walmart was six hours, three in the morning, three in the afternoon. And this is one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening. So they have more traffic in the one hour than they actually have. At right. So this is worse. So that's what they're saying. But yeah. in actuality, if this is what's actually happening, I think this is somewhat, Mr. Fairchild, in comparison to when Mr. Dahl brings us numbers. And she, your your word that you used was, I'm trying to remember what you called it. Conservative. Con you, said no, conservative. you said conservative. Conservative. To yes, me, that top line. I'd replace conservative with worst case scenario. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
if that if that makes any sense. Because when you said conservative, I was like, good God Almighty, it's going to be more than that. <laughs> yeah, no. that's just me. You know, I, I, I'm just in the gym. Yeah, we can speculate around a lot of this, but there are reasons there's industry standards. Um, and I mean, it's what she does. It's that it's it's her job to be good at these numbers. Um, and that's a nice compliment. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, and then, you know, I, I I realize the second one has been uh, deferred, but. We are, we did come here tonight prepared for, and this entire project has been discussed in context of um, somewhere around twice this. What did you say? Somewhere around twice this. But it, but is it is it, what is the combined amount of both spaces in relationship to the Walmart distribution center? It's still half half the size. I, I, no, it, 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 it would actually be the, it would actually be the exact same. Walmart's one center. Up to the mic, Mr. So, Sorry about that. So yeah. Walmart's one distribution center is eight hundred and eighty thousand square feet. If you combine both of these together, um, it'll be eight seventy, eight hundred and seventy thousand square sides. feet. But both sides combined, but one side, each side four hundred thirty five thousand square feet. And to build out to that level of capacity, right, to get to capacity on both of those. Is that a 10 year time frame, 15 year, five year? I'm, I don't know. Well, Dale, uh, the way they're going up uh, nowadays, it's probably a, you say, Gustavo, two to three years, yeah. maybe? Two to two to three year time frame to build out to that maximum capacity, yes. She basically is talking about four concrete rectangular walls that are going up. Mm -hmm. But that's building it, but that's been utilization yeah. of it. Can you be so sorry to rent it all out within two years or you know have it all sold out? Is that yeah that's 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 part of the process that's ongoing right now. Um but ideally yeah you want to build it and rent it out as fast as possible for sure. So in other words the, the traffic count will be realistic in a fairly short amount of time. Traffic count will be similar to what is at the Walmart distribution center. Yeah. yeah. That period of time, which you know, it's 213 over the course of three hours, of which we don't have a definition of how many of those are trucks. Yeah. Right. A little hands, a little, little bit unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that the traffic, even if you, I mean, I think it looks like to me the traffic is going to be more in total than the Walmart distribution center with somewhere around. Equal in square footage, the Walmart distribution center split on two different sides of the road. That's not, not good, bad, or indifferent. I'm just saying that's what the numbers seem to hash out to me. Okay, so we've talked a lot about, about the traffic. Any other concerns that our citizens brought up that we haven't covered? Noise. <laughs> um, Buffer. Oh, buffer. Um, thank you. Let me try and go back to Mr. Miles. The young lady from California talked about uh, the beauty of the hardwoods. Well, as a hunter, I like hunting in hardwoods because they're kind of open. Would y'all also include evergreens as part of maybe an interior ring of evergreens as part of your buffer? It's typically what we kind of see, but I want to let Gustavo answer that question in regards to what he typically well, like I said in the, in the winter time right you, you're going to look right through 60 feet of hardwood that, that's and but you're right in the spring in the summertime you're going to have leaves it'll be much more beautiful that's why I'm asking if we could possibly do a, a band of evergreens on the inside of that or outside doesn't matter to me good evening my name is Gustavo Bravo with Thank Bowman you. Engineering um, so in answer to your question, um, in conversations that we've had regarding this site, um, the goal is always to preserve as many trees as possible, yes, sir. Uh, with the caveat that at this time, uh, without doing any, without understanding what the grading of the site will be, it's hard to understand where the limits of disturbance, you know, will be able to preserve the trees. But I think, um, 
the goal is always to supplement um, the existing uh, vegetation that's going to remain with an off-ground cover to provide the type of buffering that you're that you're mentioning. And by that, I mean a uh, combination of, of filling in the gaps and, and certainly providing uh, evergreens that are, um, you know, that provide the, the width and, and, and can provide filling in the gaps in between the, the existing trees that will remain. Is that a goal or is that something that's that, committed that, to happening? That is the goal. Uh, there is, there is, a, there is going to be a buffer requirement regarding the number of trees that will have to be provided on a linear uh, uh, footage. And, but again, the, the goal is to preserve as many trees and then provide whatever buffering is going to be required uh, to fill in the gaps in between uh, those trees. I just say it's a very vague response. I mean, that, that... without without knowing what's going to happen in the future. Yes. Yeah, but I mean, even if even if you even if you don't know what's going to happen in the future, a response to adding buffering um, in 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 our in my opinion in our world a a goal um is a is a lot of gray area um so that's to me that's not a yes or a no uh and i don't mean that confrontational but to me the response to your question is maybe um that's incorrect it's required. okay it is required for them his goal his goal is to like I mentioned earlier, sir, um, the goal is for him to retain as many trees because Douglas, as a zoning administrator, is not going to want to charge them hundreds of thousands of dollars to plant all mm -hmm. those materials okay, as the county. But our but our requirement is for the buffering and the 25 foot buffer is what he's required to do. And he's going beyond that as the applicant to do the buffering. You also have to remember, as we've, as we've talked with the community, as you see, if um, Eric, if you can leave that um, the lower part, you see on Jackson Road um, on Zion Crossroads too. And again, we don't count on other people's buffered area, but if you have a 60 foot buffer, and then if you see that area that's 60 feet, and you see the back of the houses, they have another 60 to probably 80 feet on their own property. So you're you're talking about a, a, a tree lined area that could be 100 and 20 to 150 feet. So are you requiring them to add evergreens? Yes, to where we would, the, to it, where the um within the uh, the setback. So it's not just the trees that are existing, you're additionally requiring evergreens. There may be there may be yes, as part of the review of Bowman's uh engineered drawings of the landscaping plan, we would have to see where the um filling in the gaps. Yes. And at that at time of maturity, so not only that, they have to grow within a certain amount of time, five years, seven years, and they have to be planted at not, not so, 18 but you said inches maybe. tall, but is it gonna, six feet tall. Is it clear that it's going to be a requirement for them to plant? Is it in writing that it's going to be a requirement for them to plant it's, evergreens? You could go back to the slide I showed you where it is. It is in writing. Okay. Can, I, I will, Mr. Can, Fairchild, I will let you know, since I've been here, and working with all of the site consultants like Bowman Engineering, Shemp Engineering, any, anyone in this area, people, the Edgecombe building we're working on now, we have one of the tightest landscape ordinances in the region. Okay. Um, and that's thanks to previous planning directors that were here prior to me. I was just getting confused because the specific question was about the evergreens and all, and not so much about the amount of setbacks. Um, we understand there's going to be a lot of hardwoods and all. Right. But um, so... Just Douglas, so which, for my which, clarity, which, which what, screen is it? Yeah, what um, the previous screen. Those are the minimum standards. Those are the requirements. So, evergreen trees five feet in height, shrubs that are shrubs that kind of fill in the the gaps below eighteen inches at height. Um, so those those type of um, and if I think uh, if you go a couple slides forward, Eric, you'll see the um, uh, the yeah, right here, evergreen option. Two rows of evergreen trees shall be planted 10 feet on center and staggered within that planting strip. Um, and remember, this is a planting strip of 25 feet. They're doing one of 60 feet. So that's three times as many trees. You're, but you're talking about the hardwoods, right? No, I'm talking yeah. about these evergreen options. So so that whole thing will have to be an evergreen. If if the if it makes it so that we can no longer, it's opaque, we can no longer see the back of that building. 
or the buffering and the lighting. So what we've also talked to Mr. Vaughn and Mr. Uh, Bravo about is by doing this, there's probably going to be interior parking lot areas where we're not even having them screen because this buffer will be so large that remember I mentioned before that like if they didn't have this 25, they just had a 25 foot buffer and then you still could see through that buffer and you would see like parking lot lighting or parking lot truck parking, dumpsters, load enclosures, things like that. With this, with this requirement for being 60 feet and then the additional land that other people may own that's already buffered themselves and most likely they're not going to clear. But again, we can't guarantee that. What we can guarantee is the 60 foot buffer area with the option of the rows of evergreen trees planted on 10 feet on center. So that 10 feet on center screening would be um, relevant to the entire perimeter. Relative throughout that entire buffer area. And that yeah. starts getting really expensive and that, and again, to kind of answer Mrs. Morgan um, Johnson's questions, the, the, the I-1 zoning under underlying zoning allows 80% coverage. Well, all this buffering that they're doing, the setbacks, yes, and the setback then becomes larger um, further back from the turn lane area because that's the ultimate VDOT right away. So the setback is a constraint. So if you think of a building envelope, you have a 100 foot setback and the other setbacks that you know are shown. So that's now less land that Mr. Vaughn and Mr. Um, Gustavo Bravo can do to lay out the site. So as I mentioned earlier in their presentation, the or ordinance under I-1 zoning allows you to 80% coverage. Most of the time, we hardly ever see people exceed 50. They're at 35% coverage. That's half of what they're, not less than half of what they're allowed to do. So again, I mean, you have to you have to consider that they're doing everything here by ordinance and then some. Well, I mean, I was just considering whether they're doing the additional screening. Yes, they're that required. Was the question. Yeah. They're required to, yeah. and if if <laughs> the proper condition that um, it says the exhibit that shows exhibit B, which is the east side property, that that were passed as part of the uh, proper conditions and they would be required to do that they thank walk you. in okay thank you and okay. like i said please don't yes, take this confrontational but these are questions that if i don't ask i better ask yes sir any other questions for uh well I, so uh, comments and, and and our comment question i'm not sure where the appropriate timing with working with vdot is on this maybe it's in the site development stage but um and maybe it's a question for you for you guys as well too in terms of you know it's possible that um it makes sense to have i don't know the best way to describe it but the inside middle lane that is the designated for yielding into the other properties that would clearly require if it goes that way some proffering of the land that you're buying in order to make that happen right so you're going to have your turn lanes it's going to eat up part of your that, land, but you're also then going to maybe potentially want to have an inside lane so the traffic isn't impeded, right? Absolutely, yeah. uh, and and I believe that is shown on the on the exhibits. Um, and I apologize for that. It's it's meant to be there. Um, so the 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 middle lane will be the turn lanes, though the 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 left turn movements. Um, so right. the the northbound and southbound lanes will be on either side of that middle lane, which will become the left turn so won't be lane. The lane the traffic. And then in addition to that, then there is the right turn lanes onto both of the properties, which are also going to have storage and tapers. And all of these turn lanes will have the appropriate uh, tapering and storage um, to accommodate the, the volume. Yes. Okay. So, so for the purposes of, of people have an audience right now, there will be essentially the lane that they can turn off on to depend on the direction that they're going. And then if you're northbound, southbound, you know, you'll be able to go into a middle lane so that you're not obstructing traffic and you're able to wait. Correct. And, and and it's kind of hard to see. I mean, impossible yeah. to see there. If you, if you, well, here, let me, let me see if I can zoom in just a little bit right. more. Hold on. I mean, if, Again, it's still hard to see, but you can see some turn arrows, one going 
turning that direction, <laughs> one turning going straight, one turning into the other property. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. No, that 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 was not clear looking at it. I'm yeah. sure a lot of people didn't see that. So yeah, that's you know turning. But coming from the south, though those arrows, I mean that's it's the same it's setup. It's the same uh -huh. setup. Uh -huh. So you oh, I see so, that little arrow. I yeah, can see there are actually the three northbound yeah. lanes: one a left turn, one a right turn, and then there's the one lane turning turn. turning east into the property, uh -huh. one lane going straight, straight through, one one left turn lane going onto the other side, and then you still have the prop the lane that comes straight through on the other side. But if you have problem. just one lane going um, to north, that's a lot of traffic in one. Yeah, well, it's one lane anyway. Mm -hmm. Right, it's a one lane anyway. Yeah, I have to not, go. Boing. Not interrupting the flow. Yes, path. right. Mm -hmm. hmm. So the what's is there any um uh, I, the term we were just using I can't it's not coming to mind is there any planting that has to happen in between or on the road front it's side of, in in that setback any planting um no. yeah, term, I believe so yeah uh, on the and uh, here so yes on on the in between the road and the uh, the, the buildings is are you asking if there's additional planting required um, required vita is not going to want planting right in that site distance area so mr bravo is going to have to design it for aaron lebeau the land use engineer to be able to have the proper site distance so there again we we would have want full clearance of that right away area or if, if you pull up to an intersection and there's trees on either side and you can't see, so it's the same concept. It's a larger version of that. So is the answer yes or no that there's going to be No, there's not going to be additional plantings right at the right of way. No, sir. But uh, in between the buildings? In between the buildings, in, in, yes. In, in, my question is in between the buildings and the road, yes, on the road fronted side of the, of the development, mm -hmm. is there going to be additional planting? Yeah, he's required, he's required to do a 25-foot buffer and that's all he's doing. Where is okay. he going to put that? Where so the the V dot decides how far back that starts. The or? site distance analysis would look at where the trees should be required or uh, should be outside of the site distance area. So Mr. LeBeau would lay out and do his whatever it is, 535 feet from each direction. Um, you know, I'm I'm looking back at Mr. Bravo because he knows a lot of those magic numbers, 500, 700, you know, the higher the speed, the greater the site distance that's needed 45 the, to miles per hour 55 the building setbacks are how much building is 100 from the road parking is 50 from the road from the road from the edge of the usually we try to do the the ultimate right of way so that when the turn lanes are needed um at the time that they're warranted which is right away for our review um then they would install the landscaping and usually so in have, industrial park areas mr Fairchild, you're going to usually see berming and then landscaping as well. So then you can see through a line of sight of that berm. And then again, the screening is, um, I think, uh, I think in talking to the community last week, they were, they weren't as concerned about screening on 15 as it was behind towards their neighborhood. More between the houses and the building. More between the houses and the building. That's I've, what I've certainly that's heard from some of them that they are concerned about it. And in the, so do we have anything that says, that the screening has to go right up to the dot setbacks or if it's a hundred foot setback as long as v dot was good with it could their screening be anywhere within that hundred feet it could it's just again it all revolves back to the site right. distance requirements as i said as long as v dot's good as long as v dot is happy the we, answer is we, yes that it can we be satisfy anywhere within the state that yes sir okay we satisfy them it's there right away so so i, I went and measured this today <laughs> And to the easement, I, I figured, you know, looking up at, at the wires and, and the trees and all, to the easements about was like 15 or 16 feet. From, from the edge of the road? From the, the edge of the road to the kind of power, power line, line easement. The clearing. Yeah. And you all would know potentially is a power line easement 50 feet? Do you, all, do you all know 50 70 i, mean, I think can, it, it varies feet. but um it varies. In neighborhoods, 100. It, so this was coming in between somewhere between 50 and 60 feet mm -hmm. 
That's so about right. you're you're at um, in forgetting VDOT, you can't plant trees on Under our transmission the power. Line. That's correct. Uh, uh, and right again, away. it further is so you're at mm -hmm. you're at um, at least sixty some feet before you can even plant anything, um, because again, fifty plus another sixteen or so from the road, and so I'm just it's it's looking to me like we're going to have almost no maybe no vegetation protecting the view set of this to the road. Yet the these slides show all these trees. Um, Protecting the view from the road. I, I don't, that's just, I don't get that. But you're correct. Underneath a transmission line area, you cannot have vegetation. So, so you're saying uh, the drawing. So, so, so not, you're saying, let, let me see if I get this. Yeah. So let's just say we have a hundred, hundred foot building setback. Are, are you talking about in that area? And then if you take yeah. out the 15 feet, and then the 60 feet, so you're talking 75 feet or so say somewhere around there, somewhere okay. around 75 feet before mm -hmm. you can plant anything. Um, because again, to your point, VDOT's not gonna allow you to plant in the 15 feet right up beside the road. Then you have let's call it a 60 foot or whatever right away. So power, say you have 25 power, right? feet left out of that hundred foot setback. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? So yeah. then you so then Mr. Fairchild, you can have earthen berms because you can't plant. So then you take when he when they excavate the foundations for these buildings, that contractor moves all that dirt up onto the area under those power line easements if they allow it. If there's any, I don't know if there's underground uh there. I think it's all overhead. So overhead, it's not gonna be a problem. You put the landscape berms in. And then well, you don't that, need as much vegetation because you're that be not required. That's required because again, if you look at my slides, they Let have to go. do one of three options. Okay. They have to do existing vegetation, new vegetation, or a combination thereof, which means it's a berm with plantings. Because you can plant smaller shrubs underneath the transmission line. You just can't mm -hmm. plant trees that grow up into it. Mm -hmm. So again, okay. the so and that that's some. That's where, yeah. well, but I want to finish this also. Why do why are we showing pictures to the public of setbacks with trees in it that aren't going to have trees? Well, I think this is just showing what is. Yeah. I mean, if if you look at this map, so this is showing, showing the now. underlying. Yeah, it's showing the. Yeah. Under, I don't know how. To, I'm not, oh, I'm not sorry, it's it's just showing um, maybe. This it's is not an engineer. I'll let Mister Mister. No, it's, it's it's a it's a Google Im image, and it's basically matching that same tree line. So shown on that on the satellite image. So now again, uh, this rendering and and I believe the power is on the other side of fifteen. But this rendering shows a fifty foot parking setback, and then a hundred foot uh, building setback, and and the buildings are I don't know about twenty feet up the one corner on the building to the north is about. 20 15 20 feet from that 100 foot setback it's much greater everywhere else but again um without knowing what the ultimate grading vertical adjustments to the site are going to be at this stage we're just showing that there aren't any proposed improvements in those areas and that's why they're shown I, green i think i've got it figured out while while we were sitting here look at the road that's there mm -hmm. They're widening the roads. So the 15 feet that you're talking about that exist now is gone. So now they're up against, if you look, you see where it's kind of clear, like the trees end right there at the edge. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that goes with the setback. I had just said, put a picture in there somewhere. But that's, if you see what I'm talking about, right there at the edge of the green, you can almost see where the power line exists. Yeah. So that 15 feet that's between the road and the power easement, will be gone mm -hmm. so that'll be 15 feet so the easement will be the first 50 the power line and then it'll be 50 feet beyond that i think now this is not perfect yeah. and there's you know I, there may be laws with VDOT. i have no idea but i think that's that's one other thing is throwing us off right here because i thought the same thing you did there's a power line there i think the power line is running right down the edge of the road it's about 15 feet off yeah there. yeah which is that that's why we don't see it on here because i thought the same thing when we first looked at it he because he brought it up one time and said there's no power line there i said yeah it's supposed to be a power line that's why because the road is now wide 
So we need some better drawings. I got a question. One last question. If it, but Mike, I'm sorry, but we, we didn't, we still didn't come to closure on, and, and it has nothing to do with the project. I'm going to just say it instead of asking more questions. We have the ability to put buildings in on Google Maps. We have the building, the ability to put roads in on Google Maps. If, if we're going to make a presentation to the citizens that we're here to represent, we should not be making a presentation that shows that that roadway set back full of trees because it's not going to be. That's just my opinion. Right. Um, oh, um, the, the, go ahead. Okay. It's my well, I, I just had no, one question. Have one. one of the other neighbors talked about if something happens with y'all's grading and it becomes an issue where you're now having runoff going back, y'all are required to fix that, correct? Or whoever you can answer uh, that one better yeah, than me. Yes, that's correct. Um, so there is a there's a pond that's going to be proposed with this site, and that will att attenuate uh, the runoff generation from the site. And and yeah, I mean the, those types of facilities are designed um, to to contain or, or dam the embankment. There's an embankment dam that will hold the water back. Yes. Um, and I think know. they're worried more about the back side of the property, where the back side, if you had any kind of, where you created a runoff problem that was messing. Right. So, um, yeah, that that's a legitimate concern. Uh, the the law, laws of the state require that uh, any runoff generated from the site be attenuated before it leaves the property. And if something happens, change that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so these types of issues just never go away. Um, the streams uh, downstream from our site, from this parcel, will show if there is any kind of uh, deficiencies generated from from the development, and they will have to be taken care of. Uh, thank you. That's it. I wanted to make sure I say it's that. Two very quick questions. One is. Um, have you had any conversations with CVEC? My guess is they'd probably want to bury those lines, especially if all that road construction is going to happen there. But that's my guess. So have you had conversations with CVEC about the power lines? Uh, no conversations as of yet. And then the second one is with regard to, I think it's a good point, hours weren't really raised in terms of operations. And I understand that, you know, ideally you'd have 24 by 7 operation. Um, uh, but you know, there is also noise pollution from that operation as well, too. So, uh, and how many days a week, right? So, is you're not proffering your any, anything with regard to hours? So there's no proffering, uh, for hours or days of the week in there, no, okay. And, and in your experience operating these kinds of centers, what is the impact of noise? Well, given that, um, where I live at in Chantilly, I live around probably 10, 15 distribution centers directly across the street from my house. Um, they normally come in traffic wise early in the mornings between four and 5 a.m. And then they normally come back into the site for the p.m. times around eight or nine. So they, you know, there's not a lot of peak hours of the traffic but in terms of the noise. You don't hear I, I don't I don't hear I don't hear much of anything that's any any more abnormal than just regular traffic of cars going up and down the street. And they are big trucks coming in. Well, it's a combination. combination. It's the 18 wheelers, it's the van. Um, it just depends on which company you're talking about. I got right. 10 of them around me. So yeah. um, we got the whole mix along with a, a rock quarry right up the street from my house. So I live around it all. I think what he said, the last part is relevant in comparison with all the other traffic. That's not Fluvanna County. You, you're going to hear, and and just to be clear, I, I don't know which way I'm going to vote on this because, and I'll explain that in a bit, but the, the thought that within an area of a bunch of, of, of 100 feet or 60 feet or whatever setback of hardwoods, uh, the, the mass of the foliage is up top, as you pointed out, Mike, summer or, or winter, it doesn't make a difference. The fact that, that 100 feet of hardwoods the, the very thought that that would buffer the noise of a backup alarm on a truck just isn't logical. And so is there a, a good chance that houses are going to hear 
a backup alarm through a hundred feet of hardwoods, it's just that they're non, they're almost non-existent. Um, they are, if, if, if there's a truck at 11 o'clock at night, backing up to a loading dock, um, they're going to hear it. It's the same I said about the Cox property, um, that will be coming up. Um, that is a noise that they will live with. Mrs. Eager, do you have anything you want to say? Um, I think I think we have to um, take into consideration everything that that has been brought up, and I think that we have with uh, Mr. Miles has told us what the county um, laws are, and we will have to have it screened. Uh, this is also we have to remember this is where we wanted our industry to be. Um, and it's right there by the highway, the 64, 250. And you, it's also going to bring taxes to the county, which uh, right now I would imagine that being in farming, that the taxes are pretty low. Um, you can have residential, but then you can have more expenses with schools and rescue and things that people need. So you have to have a mix of both business, residential, and agriculture. And I think this was part of the plan, what, 2010, when this came came to us through the comp plan. So I think it, I think we have to go go ahead with what we uh, plan for the community, and make sure that it's if you know with the extra buffer and planning that it's done correctly and that can happen. Okay, anyone else? Any in? I'm gonna ask, I'm ask Mr. Payne a question real quick. Okay. This is just talking about the zoning. Later on, can we come back and put things to say not between the hours of 11 p.m.? And I'm asking that. No, and six we can't. Okay, yeah. not unless it's a special use permit or, or it's profit. Right. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. it's also worth noting that at the first public meeting, the way I understood, I was told there was um, two gentlemen in the room with an adjacent property who were anxious to find out how this goes in association with doing more. And as you said, Trish, it's. It is in an area where you all had said this this should go. Um, not not, not that's happened. They they that's said that far before we came on. Yeah, yeah. And said for that's forty years, been. fifty years. Yeah, I won't even say I won't say that far. But that take that first plan was yeah. done back in probably ninety five, two thousand. No, I won't. Yes. Yep. It's it's a very difficult decision when you know that you're impacting you know property owners and and that you know their style of life is going to be impacted by these things, but it's also, you know, part of why the county lays out its comprehensive plan designates areas where they're going to put, uh, where they expect to put industry, uh, where they expect to see growth. Um, and, uh, and that's part of the impact of it. Uh, you know, if you want to have the entire county be rural, um, then, then, you know, that's an entirely different uh, a model that other counties may be used. 85% of Fluvanna is wooded, it's forested. Um, we're facing a lot of impacts here in this area from uh, folks saying that there's been too much growth around Lake Monticello. Everybody appreciates and benefits from all the infrastructure and all the build out and all the conveniences that we now get out of, you know, the Zion's Crossroads area. There's none of that on our side of the, of the county or almost none of it, except for one business park. Um, and uh, and now we're starting to, after years, decades of putting in infrastructure and trying to make this vision come true, starting to see some of the benefits of that. Um, I mean, I think everybody knows that there's going to be a Wawa on Zion's Crossroads in the Fluvanna side. I think a lot of people are excited about that. It's a convenience that they look forward to. Um, I think there are a lot of people who would rather have a job in Fluvanna than commute to Richmond or commute to Charlottesville. And, you know, how do we get jobs in here? Well, we have to bring in industry. And that's just part of the process. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
And then <clears throat> after the um, community meeting that we had, I think it was the 11th, I took time and I drove back to see where you all, where the houses were. I went back in Hunter's Lake and went through little roads, little gravel roads, and I looked at all the homes and so I could just get an idea of where the residents were. And you all own a lot of you have a lot of property and real rural and so forth. And um, so I know what you're speaking of and you're used to that quietness and so forth. And, and I don't think we want to take any of that away. So we have a decision to make board members. And we have a motion here. I move the Board of Supervisors approves the MP 2205, a request to amend the Savannah County zoning map with respect to approximately 40 plus or minus acres, tax map 11, section 9, parcel 2, to conditionally rezone the same from A1 Agricultural General to I1 Industrial Limited with revised profit conditions dated December 8, 2022. Do I hear a second? A second. And, okay. And, Do we have do I remember discussion? right with the, the recent change? Uh, I'm sorry. Do we Go have ahead. some more discussion? That's what I was going to ask. Sorry. Um, you know, it's, I'll say the public, it's such a struggle for me because I grew up in Fluvanna and, and I think, um, a lot of this type of growth is not the positive that a lot of people, uh, think it is, especially when my vision of Zion's Crossroads, I think like many was not industrial. Um, and so when we compare to the Louisa side, um, other than the distribution center, that's not what that looks like. Um, and um, I think it's unfortunate that this that that growth area was built out to be so far away from the crossroads and and that it that it was not um, I don't know how to have been done, but how how it was not the vision wasn't to protect it from being industrial. With that said, um, there is um uh, there's a water line that got built that I don't know that I would have voted for. Um not with with no disrespect to those who did, but you know, it's is a very expensive water line and that um needs to start delivering water to something, or we're just paying for that very expensive water line ourselves. And um so when there is the opportunity at growth. Uh, to, to put something on that and to create jobs and understanding that this recent cost of community services study um, showed that it's a buck 18 in the state of Virginia, an expense for every dollar that comes in in residential revenue. So it's a net negative, but business is a net positive. And um, so I've been fighting residential. It's It's hard for me to be against everything. Um, and I'm sorry. Please well, me. oh no, no, I, I'm okay with that. There, there's a reason that Village Gardens. I can see Mr. Weaver sitting over. Yeah, there, there's a reason that Village Gardens doesn't exist as 300 some homes and 120 apartments and uh, you know, I, I, I agree. we just moved them up the road. Or yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> So I, I've I've just really been struggling. It's not often this this stuff that I really struggle with, and I've really been struggling. I and I, I think I have to. I don't. I, I think I have no choice at this point but to support it. I know the okay. votes are. I know the votes are there. It's going to pass, no, okay. no matter whether I'm against it or for it. I suspect. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fairchild. Anyone else? Any other discussion before we take a vote? I used to have brown here. Huh? You used to have brown. I used to have brown here, then I became a supervisor. Well, mine turned blonde. <laughs> Anyone else? If I used not... to have hair. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't okay. been here that long. Okay. I was okay. like that beforehand. All right. And we have a vote. We have a, a motion by Mr. O'Brien, second by Mrs. Eager. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? 
I'm going to vote opposed. I'm not against business, but the one thing, and, and I hate to say it this way, Mr. Fong, when you talked about the noise that late. Anyway. I got your dogs bark at night, too. I know. And Ken Stewart shotguns going off or rifles. All right. And the um, chair votes aye. Madam Chairman, I, you know, I, I'm yes. trying to count the votes. Is that four, 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 to, four, four, one. four to one? Four to one. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Good seeing you, sir. Y'all have a safe trip home. Um, Eric, I thought you were going to put, up, put the process. You didn't get the process done, did you? No, we just talked about that yesterday. Yeah, I haven't... yeah that's okay. Because... Um, Nate. All right. Next on the agenda is CMP 2206, David W. Ordell. Mr. Miles. Yes, good evening again. Um, people are clearing out. Um, and then 07 is the claim machine. Yes, we have two more public hearings. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I think that this request is going to probably be a whole lot simpler than the previous one. So, but we'll go through this one. Mr. Ordell is here, um, he's in the back of the room right now. Um, but, uh, we'll go ahead. Uh, ZMP 2206, David um, W. Ordell, it's a request to conditionally rezone from A1 general agricultural to the B1 general business classification. Um, district of uh, five plus or minus acres of tax map five, section two, parcel 2B. Um, the subject property is generally located on the north line of Richmond Road, Route 250. It's generally west of Troy Road and Zion Station. Um, in the Zion Crossroads Community Planning Area and Palmyra Election District. And we, you'll see that's generally there. And we as staff and Mr. or working with Mr. Ordell, I think uh, Ms. Smack, Mr. Overstreet and I have worked with him um, almost about a year now um, to help him out since about April last year. Um, so this, this site is quite hard to find. So Jason Overstreet did a good job of showing you where it's located in reference to Fort Road. So when you're traveling, um, that's westbound on Richmond Road. Um, you'll see basically uh, this really small parcel with lots of bread bunch, um, which is going to be beneficial for Mr. Ortel. And again, the the subject property is um, zone day one, and all the property around is um, zone day one. The parcels to the rear, kind of the north west pro property uh, owners of uh, above all of Oliver Creek, those are actually lots that back up in Louisa County um, down to um, Zion Crossroads and 250 area. Uh, and then um, uh, the property uh, just to where the north of there is a large tract of land behind Mr. Ardell's parcel. Uh, we did ask, uh, and I think he wanted it uh, to get it surveyed, um, he was able to get it surveyed um, recently, and he's able to see where he, where the areas that he's going to be able to put in an entrance working with VDOT on the uh, west side the, with the creek there. It's not going to be conducive for that, um, but more on the far um, far right side of the slide here is where he would be doing his entrance for his proposed use. Um, if you all remember at the end of the summer and August 17th, you all approved some additional um, B1 and I1 uses. This is the machinery sales and service. It's farm machinery. Um, the sales and service of machinery, um, uh, such as farm tractors, and, and you can see all the other attachments. Um, he has also worked with us over this time to express an interest in operating a feed and seed store. It's kind of a unique thing we used to have in the county and no longer do for the most part, other than tractor supplies and things like that. Um, so the feed and seed store and garden center facility um, that he would like to own and operate would be in conjunction with the machinery sales and service. 
And um, both of these uses are permitted uses in the B1 zoning if they this was rezoned to this request. Um, so again, just like in the previous case, you'll see that um, we worked with Mr. Ardell to proffer out some uses, uh, B1 by right uses, uh, automobile repair, boarding houses, guidance services, R RV sales, and sheltered care facilities. Then he went a little beyond that since he's got very limited space to work with. A lot of these other uses just weren't conducive even as an SUP. So, um, and also this helps him in working with VDOT to proffer out these uses because then his entrance standards get a little reduced, um, basically not having these additional outdoor recreational kind of uses, uh, lumber yards, railroad facilities, high traffic type uses, even if he came back to you all with this SUP. So site design and retail display, um, he has talked uh, to the community um, uh, about possibly having also some uh, Amish storage buildings along with um, farm machinery equipment and other retail display items. Um, we would not allow and VDOT would not allow that to be up in the VDOT right away in the setback area. Um, we would allow for some um, limited display items like gazebos or things that he could integrate into his property uh, entrance for um, aesthetic purposes. Um, but basically, uh, just like the previous request, the applicant um, would prepare a site design that allows for the display areas um, to be outside of that buffer area and for him to have proper um, commercial entrance uh, standards met and in, in coming off of uh, Route 250 for VDOT approval. Uh, we'll, we'll say the Planning Commission recommended approval by a four to zero vote um, at last month's meeting. Um, and there were public speakers in support of this request um, that night. And um, even further, the commissioners uh, felt this was a needed land use for our county. We, we, you have to go to the valley or up 15 into Orange County to buy farm equipment, farm machinery. Um, so, and like I said earlier, we've been working with him, uh, I'm sorry, since May. Um, but we think it's really a good opportunity for us to continue to support small business owners and business owners that want to stay in the county um, and operate their business rather than working in surrounding counties and having to um, to commute. So um, at this point, I'll let, um, sorry, Madam Chair, for Mr. Yeah, Ordell to come questions forward. questions for Mr. Miles before the applicant, Mr. Ordell, come forward. Oh, Mr. Miles, this yes, is a by right use. Is that correct? His farm, his machinery sales, if it were um, rezoned to B1, would be a buy right use. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The question is Mr. Ordell? I'm David Ordell. I live in Keswick, Virginia, but I own two different, well, three different parcels in Fluvanna County now. One is a home that my daughter lives in, and one is a farm. Any questions, Mr. Ordell? You want to give us your idea? I was at the planning meeting when you spoke. Right, right. Well, uh, Mr. Miles has really he summed it all up. Huh? Yeah, yeah, they've really been good to help me. Yeah. I tell you, this was kind of out of my box to do something like that, and they have really kind of and and Jennifer Schmack also, you know, who kind of helped me get the whole thing going you know they've been really good but right. yeah it, it's not a real intensive use of the property you know it, it's going to be something that kind of grows along it's not going to be all of a sudden just boom you know right there it'll it'll be farm equipment hopefully we'll get we can get it rezoned and and then add a few other things on as we go you okay. know you have a sense of sort of what your business plan is over the next five years you know yeah, hopefully we million, 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 two million, three million. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. I'm not delusional. I'm not delusional. I'm not delusional. I'm not delusional. <laughs> this is this is used farm equipment. It's not not you know a great thing uh, as far as huge money making things you know. But it is you know new farm equipment's got so expensive. People need to buy used farm equipment. Weekend farmers need used equipment that works. And I sell good stuff. It works, and uh, people are happy with it. So you know, do you, do you work on it if it breaks down? I do. I do. I try to. I try to sell low use equipment, not wore out junk. You know, you got to know what you're looking at, and you buy stuff that is uh, 
is not wore out, refurbish it a little bit and send it on to people and they go make hay and feed their cattle and horses, you know? So, so sort of to that point, I mean, I think there's sometimes a tendency to keep equipment that doesn't necessarily work so that you have parts to fix the equipment that isn't that that maybe can be fixed no i won't i won't junk the place up like that that's not you know that kind of stuff doesn't help um doesn't help your good stuff you know you want pretty farm equipment pretty farm equipment sells itself you know junky stuff that you don't want around that take the parts off and send it to the scrap yard uh, this parcel is not very deep right um so will you have um uh, your merchandise for sale it will be out in front so that people see it from the road it, it will be like that hopefully right that's one of the this was a piece of property that just didn't have a whole lot of uses to it because of the the way it's shaped you know it was just kind of a bad a bad it shouldn't you know it's non-conformant pretty much as far as you know the, the shape of it but uh it'll work for what we do and it'll it'll look nice mm -hmm. you know and i noticed that we thought it was five acres but it turned out to be closer to four more like four right mm -hmm. yeah a little bit over four but it's uh it's doable for what i need okay so um if we have nothing else from the board i'm going to open the public hearing Right now, you can have a seat, Mr. Okay. Cordell. Thank you. Anyone would like to speak on um, this project, please come. You have five minutes to make your comments and speak on the topic and speak to the board. Do we have anyone who would like to speak to this project? No one. I see no one, one coming. Uh, oh, there's someone online. You have online? Yep. Yes, Ms. I Warren. see a hand. Hi, Miss Katie. Unmute yourself. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes mm -hmm. okay. Um, I would just say, based on listening to this applicant and where he is located with regard to uh, the other agricultural areas, to me, this is what I would imagine would be a logical rezoning from A1 to business versus something industrial. So, um, and at least there's not going to be as much traffic as would be with an industrial. So it seems like this would be a good one to approve. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Anyone else would like to make a comment? Anyone online? Ms. Harris doesn't count. Yeah, no one? see anyone else online, okay. tonight, Madam Chair. All right, then I will now uh, close this public comment. Come back to the board for any comments. Motion is on the screen. Um, I move the Board of Supervisors approve CMP 2206, a request to amend the Bluvanna County zoning map with respect to approximately five acres of tax map five, section two, parcel 2B, to conditionally rezone the same from A1 ag general agriculture to the B1 general business zoning district with Proffered conditions stated December 29th, 2022. Should I change that to four acres? Since that's what the. Uh, Mr. Miles. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, Ms. What do you think, Mr. Miles? Yeah, ma'am. It's still um, under Mr. Mel Sheridan's um, assessment data. S5. It's still five. So okay. we, we kept okay. it at that. But once he files and yeah. his, records his plat, he'll pick up on that and change it. It's only important to. To help identify the property, it's not. Yes, ma'am. It's not restrictive of, or or expansive of, of the actual area. And we have the plus or minus, so it's definitely a minus. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. Just want to be sure. Yeah. All right. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Did anyone second? second. Mr. Sheridan. Motion by Mrs. Eager and second by Mr. Sheridan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Chair votes aye. I'd like. To I have to Thank see you. Thank you. Please come and see you. Uh, the next public hearing is ZMP 2207, the Green Machine Incorporation. Ms. Miles. All right. So the last public hearing this evening um, is also on the 250 quarter. This is uh, ZMP 2207, the Clean Machine Incorporated. 
is a request to conditionally rezone from A1 general agricultural to the I1 limited industrial zoning district of six plus or minus acres of tax map for section A parcel 24. Um, the subject property is generally located in the southwest quadrant of Richmond Road, Route 250 in memory lane, State Route 698 right there at um, memory lane um, in the Zion Crossroads Community Planning Area and Palmyra Election District. I'm going to go over some of the um, uh, planning and land use things, and I believe uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Schlein uh, from uh, Shemp Engineering is going to get a little more detailed information for you, but it is generally located um, on the south side of 250 there, memory lane. You'll see if you recognize uh, the two parcels, um, the Cosner building itself is located right there, Fox Glen subdivision. The other two parcels that uh, we'll show you on the zoning map um, are already zoned I-1 just to the west of there. You'll see that um, those two parcels, um, they're looking to add um, the remaining parcel there to be I-1 um, and incorporate those into one development. And then this is a closer version of what they're proposing. You can see it's a C parcel here wrapping around an existing house. Um, the folks in that house have life rights to that house right now for um, for their residents. So again, um, in the proffering out of uh, some of the uses, we worked with the applicant, the clean machine and Chimp Engineering um, to remove uh, these these uses. And they also went in and with, with again, kind of like Mr. Ardell's property, it's not quite of a really large parcel. So um, some of these uses, um, they're never going to do aviation facilities, truck terminals, that kind of thing. Railroad. I'm sorry. I laughed at that one, railroad facility. Yeah, railroad. <laughs> um, so again, um, and this this one's going to be real specific because they really know what they want to do. So um, we'll be showing those um, slides and then the shimp engineering go further. But um, all industrial uses would be screened from view from adjacent residential and agricultural districts. And again, um, that, that screening option of evergreens and that 25 foot planning buffer um, will, will achieve that. And that this is their layout and I'm not trying to steal your thunder, but um, I, I thought after um, us showing some of the ones in the um, Vaughn property, you'll see that the um, evergreen plantings that are um, located all around that perimeter and there's none on the west side because that's industrial. So the industrial um, warehouse kind of uh, flex warehouse buildings that are shown there. Um, these are kind of more business incubator type businesses where you might be a landscaping company, a carpet com company, cleaning company, and you would move into this facility. You might have been running a landscaping business from your home with your two sons or whatever, and then you needed the space to move into a facility like this. So that's, that's their basic concept um, there. And that's Basically, all I have, the Planning Commission did recommend approval of this, uh, four to zero, just like uh, Mr. Ardell's request, um, along with the um, proffered conditions um, that you have tonight. Madam so, Chairman, I think the vote was actually three to one with one abstention. I'm sorry. Yes, it was. Thank you. I'm sorry. Mr. Goode uh, did uh, did have concerns. Mr. Goode, Mr. Goode abstained. Yes. And who was the one? Do, or, or do we know? Well, Mr. Was three Goode. one. Oh, and, no, it was, and, it, was, it was three in favor, yep. oh, one, one abstain, I see what and you're one absent. Yeah. Right. Okay, I got you. Thank you. Thank um, you, Mr. Payne. Yes, that's correct. Um, there were some concerns uh, from across the street um, from uh, the Miss Kading and some of the folks that lived over there. And I think between the Planning Commission and the board that the applicant and their consultant has um, brought forward the screening requirements to be much clearer and to show that. And so she can go over that now. Okay. If that's so appropriate. Any any questions from Mr. Miles? Are these what we're about uh, to hear are these proffered? Applicants. These are proffered. Yes, okay. All screening we're about to hear about is proffered. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Hi, uh, good evening, Chair Booker and members of the board. My name is Kelsey Schlein. I'm a planner with Shimp Engineering. Um, I'm here tonight representing uh, the Clean Machine Inc., who is the contract purchaser of tax parcel 4A24. Uh, here with me tonight from uh, 
ownership is Chris K. Bash as well. If you all have any questions for him, I'd invite him to come up at any point. Um, so diving into our presentation here, when, when Chris and his team approached us, there, there are three properties currently that are under common ownership um, of the Pupilo Trust. And my client is acquiring all three properties. Um, so the context image here, you can see the two properties to the left, tax parcel 4A 25, or 25 and 26. Um, and then 4A24 is the only property that is subject to this rezoning request this evening. So in total, the properties are, are about 12 acres. Um, and specifically, we're just uh, have our rezoning request in for tax parcel 4A24, which is approximately six acres. Um, next slide, please. And so you can see here um, the three properties just in the context of the zoning map. Uh, so the two properties uh, to the uh, west of the subject property were rezoned to I-1 in 2005. Um, and so when Chris and his team proposed us wanting to move forward with a cohesive development on all three properties that they'll bring under ownership, our request is to rezone um, to I-1 and their intent for developing the property is for a flex warehousing space. Um, on this property, they really saw um, kind of a need for businesses in transition, perhaps, you know, you're moving out of your basement or you're moving out of, you know, 2,000 square feet that you're in and you want to move into a space that's 5,000 square feet, 10,000 square feet, something like that. And so the idea was that these would be flex warehouses, approximately, you know, 10,000, 20,000 square foot footprints, but then divided up into smaller spaces. And you will see that um, on our concept plan and later slides, just calling attention to the site here. Um, previously, the the site has been used, I believe, as a dominion as a utility laydown area. Um, so there is an existing commercial entrance to the site. Um, that uh, was actually a condition of, of uh, the prior I-1 approval for there to be a commercial entrance constructed. So this is kind of remnants of the, the prior rezoning action on the property in the former um, utility laydown site. There is an existing right turn taper to the site um, as well. We have run turn lane warrants on um, the anticipated maximum build out on the site. Um, currently with existing background traffic and the traffic proposed with this development, uh, their turn lanes are not warranted at the moment, but turn lanes um, run with site plan. And so uh, if, you know, background traffic changes over time, any kind of traffic improvements at the time of site plan, um, you know, will, will be implemented uh, correspondingly. Next slide, please. So you can see our concept here. So the overall concept development um, of the flex warehousing space, and it's just the parcel highlighted in orange there. Um, that's the subject of this I-1 uh, rezoning request. Next slide. So I really wanted to focus tonight on, on the screening requirements because I think you know the main item that we discussed at the Planning Commission, and I, I believe based on the conversation we had at the Planning Commission and the main uh, reason that I felt uh, Commissioner Gobe abstained was just because we were working through screening items. And so I felt it was critically important to make that much more clear <laughs> this evening of exactly what 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 we're proposing and exactly what's going to be required on this site. Um, I think, you know, we can all read this ordinance and see the words of what perhaps is required, but it's helpful to see it. So these are the screening requirements um, for Fluvanna County. Um, we have the opportunity, uh, you know, by, in my capacity working at a civil engineering firm to work at in localities all across Virginia. Um, Fluvanna's landscape requirement is pretty robust um, comparatively. So these are several options that we have to choose from. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, I wanted to break down just how many trees are required. Um, so along the Route 250, there is a screening buffer required. That is a minimum if we go with the mixed planting option, which from the previous screen was one of our five options to pick from. If we go with the mixed vegetation option, it's one large tree, one medium shade tree, one evergreen tree, three evergreen shrubs for every 20 or linear feet of frontage. We have nearly a thousand linear feet of frontage. That results in 32 large shade trees, 32 medium shade trees, 32 evergreen trees, and 96 shrubs. It's a lot of landscaping. And I know at, particularly for the uh, the property owners uh, you know, across the, the, the street screening 
uh, is, is an item that we talked about at the planning commission. And so I just wanted to make that clear of what the, what the requirements are um, and demonstrate that um, for, for the, the board this evening. Um, next slide, please. So that's that's all that I have for you. I'm available for any questions. And again, Chris Gabash is available as well and appreciate the opportunity to present this project to you tonight. All right, any questions for the presenter, the applicant, the SHIM representative? <laughs> and yeah, uh, Mr. Class Chris, of, do you have any class questions? Class of 2015. Huh? Huh? I'll take it. Yeah. I'll take that That's <laughs> any day. <laughs> any questions for Anna? Chris? I didn't get your last name. Okay, you want to come up? Does anybody so, have any questions? Any questions for? Sure. Is your dad Charlie? Yeah, I don't you told that again. He looks like you. Well, but but you you guys are in essentially the real estate business, and you you pretty much probably have ideas of who's you said noise. this space. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Oh, you don't know. Oh, uh -huh. okay. I'm sorry. sorry. Okay. Do you, do you have some general ideas? We, we don't have anyone yet. No. We're trying to do up to 5,000 square feet. We're trying to fill in the gap of everything around there is 20, 30. You know, there's not a lot of small spaces. There's no 2,000 square foot spaces. So we're going to divide these up, build the suit kind of style. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I don't want 10, 15,000 square foot users. Gotcha. I think there's enough of that built out in and around Zion. So we're trying to do smaller and um, we're still working on it. We might we we might sell them as condos and and you know let people buy their own space. Mm, gotcha. That's that's up to the partnership more than me. I'm more the real estate. When side. you say condos, you mean condos for this kind of business, yeah yeah right? yeah. I mean right no not <laughs> not not residential condo yeah. 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 building to that <laughs> you know the guy who owns a carpet store can own his space versus right. just renting because there's no option for that in Science Crossroads. Right. 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 There's a couple of. Developments in Charlottesville that have kind of that similar concept, yeah. like where the rug place is. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple that uh, I mean, but there's just not nearly enough for the. Once you become successful at a business, you want to stop renting, right? I mean, regardless of what the business is, you want to stop paying rent. Right. right. So, um, you know, and it's not it's not that big of a project that you know we couldn't just sell it off. And then, you still have two more pieces of property to your. I'm sure you look, but the two other pieces of industrial property that are zoned there that you're going to own and is the intention just to expand the same concept no this that, that is old that's, oh, that's all through yeah see that's okay. all yeah see it's this is the c property right here right there's one i1 and then there's the other i1 so the building one. layout is just conceptual meaning when it shows that it's, it's just crossing over area. on the other it's just because you had to put buildings there to show yeah we yeah. this is assuming we get the rezoning that's what the property will look like and the, and the property to the left, looking at this, is an I one piece of property owned it by is. somebody that's, else. That's 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 the Cosner building. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Um, if you all said I, I missed it, the uh, exterior of the building. Any idea what your? I mean, any chance it's just going to be corrugated steel buildings or? Um, no, I mean or, we haven't. We haven't gone down that path at all. That's more of a site plan thing. We're, we're just trying to it's sort of lay it out step. right now. Well, I know it's next step in the technical mm -hmm. aspect of it. You know, they, they might have a vision. Yeah, already. Yeah. Okay, anything else? If not, um, thank you all. What's, what's roughly the square footage of all of it together? All the buildings? Yeah. There's about 100,000 square feet. Yeah. Okay. All six buildings. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I'm ready to open the um, public hearing. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. There we go. Open the public hearing. Anyone who would like to comment on this project, uh, please come forward, give your name, address, and you have five minutes. Do we have, we have no one in the audience. So I, uh, do we have anyone online? Is Elizabeth? Um, you're sorry. muted. Can't. You have to hit yeah, unmute. Unmute. You're working on it. Okay. Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, yeah. Um, again, I spoke uh, some time ago when this came up, and 
like to say, um, we, uh, my me. name is, uh, excuse me, yeah. my name is um, Ron Moore, and um, I live what? right across the street from uh, where all this is going to happen, and um, we're pretty much resigned to the inevitability of what's going to happen is going to happen. There's no turning back, um, and we really can't do anything other than hope and trust that whoever is going to develop this area right across the street from us, and believe me, we've seen that piece of property totally go down the hill over 20 some years from beautiful rural to what it is now and what it's going to be. And we just hope that the people who develop it will keep us in mind and try not to make it any uglier than it has to be and maybe even make the road frontage on 250 attractive. I know that's not really in the business plan, but it would sure help the area. And God, we would sure appreciate it. And like I say, we don't have the money or anything to fight people or do any of that. So if there's anyone in the planning commission or whatever commissions there are who have any um, feeling for people who've lived here for many years, uh, we hope they'll just consider us and try to make the thing as attractive and unobtrusive as possible. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak? Anyone online? Katie, unmute. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, Katie Ward, 249 Buckridge, Troy. Um, I don't know if this was an appropriate time if I had a question that I didn't think was addressed in the presentations uh, about traffic and if there was any kind of anticipation of, I know it's a smaller scale thing and possibly depending on who rents out the space, but that I don't feel like that was, other than just the entrance to the road, I didn't really hear anything about um, what the traffic impact might be on 250, either coming from Charlottesville or coming from Zion's Crossroads. We hear you, but okay. okay. We um, can answer that question yeah, later. We have to okay. we deliberate. Okay, and then um, I just, uh, in support of uh, my neighbors across, um, uh, Mr. Moore, what, what he said, I also feel that the area on 250 that we all have that live here have used to love driving to town to see all the rolling hills and all the beautiful trees. And there's now an eyesore of an abandoned concrete plant. And there's the, you know, we already have to live at the prison. We can't really change that. Um, but it's in Cosner's building that's just been sitting there. It's just everyone, when I have people come visit from town, I just have to describe, hey, go past this dilapidated thing, go past this ugly thing, go past the prison, and oh, we're that pretty road that's called Blue Ridge Drive, but not so, that's not so pretty anymore. Um, so I, and oh, by the way, there's all the fire hydrants that still have trash bags on them, and oh, there's always orange markers. So I would just ask um, in support of my neighbors that you really do, can, and myself as I commute into town, um, and just to try to, for whatever way you can, um, have some kind of decent appearance because it's embar It's honestly, it's getting embarrassing to live near Science Crossroads. I feel like it's the armpit of the county. I really do. And I love Fluvanna and it's like that water tower at Zions that has this picturesque mural of the river and the mountain and the canoe, like, okay, that no one that lives near Zions that's not what it looks like for us here. Maybe in Palmyra, where it seems like everyone wants to have Palmyra be all beautiful and preserved historically. But, um, but yeah, I, I don't know, if, you know, if this comes in the site plan or, or what, but whoever can have those decisions and take those considerations and please, because we will be more likely to appreciate this diversified tax base if it came 
with consideration for the beauty that we know and love in Slovenia. That's it. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak on this project? Yes, this is Elizabeth Tating, um, 2451 Richmond Road. And I have to comment on the fact that this has been a very long day for the Board of Supervisors and there is a lot of yawning and eye rubbing. And could we possibly postpone the decision and put this decision to the top of the list for the next meeting? Thank you for your comment. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak on the project? If not, I'll close this public hearing and take it to the board members to discuss. There was a question on traffic. Ms. Schleier? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to traffic. So um, this is an interesting application in that when we presented our traffic numbers, we presented them uh, for the entirety of the site and a full build out, but the rezoning request is really only six acres of that. Um, and it's an odd shaped parcel. So, I, I mean, just kind of doing a rough calculation of a building that could fit on that C-shaped parcel within the setbacks, you know, 20,000 square feet of industrial, that's going to come out to be like 50 trips a day. Um, so for, for that was just kind of basing it off of the numbers that we had presented for the whole site, but then deducing it down to what we're looking at with this rezoning, which is just this parcel. Do you have anything for the whole parcel? Yes. Yeah, we do. We, we did present numbers for, for the whole parcel with the application. So, and, um, Again, these these numbers and you all got got in depth on on traffic on your first item, and so the you know the the numbers are are from from the same national standard that were used in that application as well. Um, uh, the I know the the word cons conservative was used, but they're they're typically higher than than what we see. So anyway, so for we did an evaluation of um, in total a hundred and twenty thousand square feet. Um, so we did a 10,000 square foot specialty trade contractor evaluation, a 50,000 square foot light industrial evaluation, and a warehousing of 60,000 square foot evaluation. And so that is a daily, uh, that's a peak hour AM total of 62 trips and a PM peak hour total of 63 trips uh, for that total evaluation of 120,000 square feet for those various users. Okay. Any other questions? It's not really a question. I, I, the, the Moors, I believe, spoke about the U, but they're right across the street. And it seems to me that you're making a substantial effort to improve the view with all the trees and shrubberies that you're going to be putting in there. Is that a fair statement? or No, that's, I mean, that's a really fair statement. So, I mean, once a site plan is submitted on, on the property, um, improvements shown on, on the site plan are required. So if we don't put them in, right. we post a performance bond. And so then the, the county is going to hold our bond if we don't put them in or the county will come in and, and put it in. Um, and if any of those items aren't shown or, you know, the, the trees aren't maintained, they die over time, aren't replaced, whatever. If the landscaping isn't kept up in accordance with the site plan, you can be put in site plan violations. So there are those checks moving forward, um, whereas those checks don't exist currently on the property because there's no site plan in place. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Any other discussion? If not, there's a motion on the screen. I, I'd just say, um, and this is in some ways not even entirely relevant to this property, and I understand the property owner not having this decision yet but you know when we talked about the self-storage okay. excuse me behind food line um a lot of the conversation was a concern about those steel buildings and you know where people from their homes can see it and um i just feel like at some point we need to start expecting that people are going to know what's coming beside them before we vote for things um and there's ways for people to do that without the county having to ask for it. But it just it's concerning to me that we're we really don't know often 
much about what we're approving to go into segment and around people's homes. That, on that matter, I mean, an architectural review board would fall in line after the rezoning or before the rezoning? That's sorry, Fred. Architectural, architectural review, review board, board would fall in line before the rezoning That'd or after, after the rezoning? It would probably have to be after. Yeah, after, right? So, so a lot of things going to happen after it, it, rezoning well, that it, we have some let, control let, of. Let me qualify that. Oh, that okay. answer. We don't have a. a right. I know we don't. Yeah, we don't. So the question would be what. If yeah, what, 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 right. whatever we, we do, right. Right. then you would apply that. Mm -hmm. um, normally, I would say if you're rezoning, let's say from um, A1 to, to, to I1, you got to get that first. But mm -hmm. it's the uh, condition of that is going to be that, that to get approval from the, the uh, ARB, the or whatever the ARB is. Or and, and the ARB is going to set guidelines in terms of what yeah. buildings are going to look like uh, right yeah. this is not the sometimes end. they're strict right well it is here it is here, it is here now as yeah, far as they, what's at, what the outside of the buildings are it is the end but but it is but, i'm sure it is the one it's not yet no it is because we don't as far correct me if i'm wrong once we approve as far as what the buildings are made of whether it's steel brick or whatever this is the end right, right? well subject to the site plan and any ordinances yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, so but, yeah, but, but yeah, but I don't think that 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 we're dictating what they're basically yeah, we don't have what you're saying is accurate. Right. That's it's not absolute, but it's, it's yeah. basically yeah. accurate. It, it is the end, but if we had say an ARB or something, then that would be a next step that would review that. An additional step. Yeah. You, would, you would start to create the ordinances that the ARB can then use as part of their own yeah. process. Gotcha. So we just don't that I'm aware of. We don't have to I mean, we have more ordinances with regard to signage than anything else when it comes to what a building looks like. So maybe right? yeah. could I had a proposal to, to repeal yes. the sign ordinance and make <laughs> life easier for all of us. I'm sure Mr. Mr. Miles would agree. But, but, no, but, but it's but, I mean, I mean yeah. we, we we joke about it, but it's but you know Mr. Fairchild's point is a is a good point, which is that you know as we start to approve more things, maybe this becomes more relevant. You know? I don't I don't want but, to divert the board's attention or anything, but I have quite a lot of experience with ARBs. And I can tell you right now that I affirmatively do not recommend, not for this county. Mm -hmm. and, and I've heard you say that before. Um, while I'm very concerned for citizens like these citizens who live across the street, like other citizens and other things we've approved, you know, I don't know that there's a way to, I don't know that there's an easy path. Years, uh, years ago, I, I wouldn't it's kind of in between things. I had a fruit shake stand business on the downtown mall, and I had to go in front of the Charlottesville ARB to tell them what the fruit shake stand was going to look like. So. It wasn't brick, was it? <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't brick. a brick fruit shake. <laughs> no, it was made out of wood, that little pretty, uh, you know, umbrella and uh, signage and so on, and it was uh, was well loved. Well, <laughs> you know, when we, when we're making coming up with all these concerns, I know you're taking note of it. I mean, if they're that. I mean, they're that important, then we ought to be able to have something in the plan that will address that. So I we agree. don't have to hear it every time. Well, we don't have Mr. To uh, Mr. Sheridan's got to run off to a fire, so he's asking that we I'm, make I'm, the I'm not trying to cut things yeah. short. Oh, I thought you had gone. But, I came uh, back because I thought the okay. vote was going to be pretty yeah, I think well, this is gonna... the, beyond the, uh, so, really the public hearing. So you can stop. Talking now. <laughs> <laughs> I move the board of supervisors approves the MP 2207, a request to amend the Savannah County zoning map with respect to approximately six plus or minus acres of tax map four, section A, parcel 24th, conditionally rezone the same from A1 general agricultural to I1 limited industrial zoning district with buffer conditions dated December 13, 2022. Okay, second, please. Second. Okay, there's a motion by Mr. O'Brien, second by Ms. Eager. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry. All right. Any opposed? Chair votes aye. I'm not running, guys, but if anybody wants to volunteer in the 10th story, we we'll appreciate any applications. All right. Good night. Be careful. All right. Oh, I'm the next action matter. And Thank I. You. The thing, the um, historical courthouse request. I think all of us are familiar with 
all yeah. the emails. Oh, we just have to ratify. Yeah, again, we, we spoke about this at the last yeah. meeting that we were going right. to come up with a letter to, to request funding through the general assembly session. Mm -hmm. um, working through Miss uh, Miss Harris, Miss Kilpatrick, and um, David Blunt with the TJPDC gave mm -hmm. us some guidance on the proper method and and means to put that put that budget amendment right. through. Um, I, I saw it today. David Blunt sent language that it is. It's it's on the website yeah. there, and so so let me just pull up the yeah. That's the I budget think, amendment, and just the yeah. letter really quick. It just talks about the history of the historic courthouse, right? Uh, you know that we did a study about it by a, by a firm. Um, uh, you know, believing that the that it must be must be restored. The full cost, full restoration cost is two point two million, and the county is requesting three hundred seven. Three hundred seven thousand nine eighty five for for more uh, impending um, fixes to the building. That's kind of the gist of the letter. And we got it in on time. We did. I did the January the thirteenth with, with much with thanks to Ms. Harris and Ms. Kilpatrick and then yeah. and David Blunt. So. Okay. May I have the motion to ratify, please? I move. Go ahead, somebody else. Yeah. Thanks. I move the board of supervisors ratify the letter sent to Delegate Lee Ware to request funding from the General Assembly for the renovation of the historic building. Second, please. Second. All right, it's moved by Mrs. Eager and seconded by Ms. O'Brien. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Chair votes aye. And we have Mr. Sheridan has left. Um, can we move? Do we need to do the Board committees. Can, make and so can we do those later? Can we not do in? Mike's not here. What do you think? Oh, um, can we? I, it, and we know the center. Are you talking about the, the no, no, she's talking about the, the updates, I think. Board yeah. commission. Mm -hmm. The board. Are you talking committees. about this, this appointment? Well, the appointment. We have an appointment. We, we have an the appointment. Board commission. Yeah, we have an appointment. Yeah, appointment for the. Um, Planning Commission. Yes. Oh. Yeah, it's it's the TJPC yeah, Regional Housing Partnership. It's it's a yeah. planning fish planning commission official um to, to serve on that uh on, on that committee. So yeah. so the planning commission appoints yes certain people to yes and, and the planning commission um discussed uh, it and and and, and Bree. Ms. Ms. Bree Key was was kind of the right yeah the recommendation, recommendation. from the planning commission. Yeah, but we do have yeah, to make the motion to you approve do. her. Yep, as being on. Can we have that motion, please? Yes, I move the board of supervisors to approve the following board commissioner committee appointments: Thomas Jefferson, Planning District Commission, Regional Housing Partnership Planning Commission official, Andre A. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For a term beginning on 1-18-2023. And ending on 6 30, 2026. All right. Boy. Second. All right. We have a motion by Mrs. Eager, second by Mr. O'Brien. All in favor? Aye. All right. And chair votes aye. All right. Yeah, ladies, uh, suddenly on a lot of boards. Yes, sure is. Um, That's a reschedule. Yeah, we're going to reschedule the um, uh, BOS's boards, commissions, and so forth. But we did have some action yeah. items that we need to do. Is that that's unfinished business? Well, right now we've got consent. Well, let me see here. We're up to consent first. We have to do consent before we do anything in okay. unfinished or, or new business. All right. All right. Which let's do the um, yeah. Any objection? The consent. Anyone have any? Checks anything on the consent agenda? The minutes of January the 4th, 2023 meeting. Anybody have anything for that? Want to pull anything? If not, can I have a motion to approve? So made. Second, please. I need a second. Uh -huh. All right. We have a motion by Mr. O'Brien, second by Mr. Fairchild. All in favor? Uh -huh. All right. And the chair votes aye. Okay. Then we go to unfinished. Business. Yeah. So the boards do you not do you not want to discuss any of these this evening? You said you want to you want to wait. Sure. No, we don't want to yeah. discuss. That's fine. We, don't we table that. Yeah, we can do that. We'll go something else. Sure. 
Uh, let, let, let me let me just make one one quick comment on that, mm -hmm. just as a as as a matter of without getting into any of the discussions. The one thing is for the finance board because I think Miss Solis, right. aren't we scheduled to have a finance board meeting here in the near future potentially? And maybe it's not before the next board meeting. Well, but but he, but it doesn't matter. He has to. He can no longer serve on it. Correct. Yeah, Miss right. Miss Miss Booker will be now the finance board. Okay. Miss Miss Booker is, is on that now. She is. Yes. She yes. is. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 We'll we'll bring this up at the next okay, meeting. Okay, yeah, let's yeah. just bring it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've, been going everybody's... The, I've been going to the chairs and mayors and chairs. Mayors, too. Oh, you yeah, have but right. Certainly, that's that's entirely yeah, up to you. Right. Was, okay. Mr. Sheridan asked me to do that. But yeah. That's about it to you. Right. We we'll, we we'll, we can talk about that too. All right. Uh, now these the unfinished business that we came out yeah, of. Yeah. Would this be new business, Mr. Painter? Uh, it's your new business. Yeah. It's a new business. Yep. Okay. I, I have suggested motions. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the, the first is uh, I move to ratify the authorization for the county attorney to negotiate a settlement of the condemnation litigation between the county and Flint Properties LLC. Okay. And uh, I note that the the that recommendation is not specifically reflected here because it's necessarily confidential pending and settled. Oh, negotiations. All right. Okay. okay. So who would like to make that motion that I, we just heard? I move to ratify the settlement negotiations as discussed with the county attorney. Uh, uh, ratify the authorization of the county the attorney to negotiate a settlement of condemnation litigation between the county and Flint Properties LLC. Ratify the authorization for the county attorney to negotiation to negotiate the settlement between the county and, and Flint Street Properties Flint. And, the, and the condemnation of Flint Properties. All right. I'm disappointed. I thought was, you that was, was that clear? <laughs> we need a second. Second. All right. We have a motion by Mr. Bryant and a second by uh, Mr. Fairchild. All in favor? Aye. Uh, and chair votes aye. And it was one more. Please. The other motion would, would be, I move to ratify the action of the board to approve the waiver by the county administrator of the prohibition to hire a certain employment. Uh, certain employment, um, appointment? Appointment, yes, employment, appointment. Say it one more time. <laughs> I move to ratify the action of the board to approve the waiver by, uh, by the county county administrator of the prohibition to hire a certain employment application. Okay. All right. Who wants to make that motion? Not me. I move to ratify the uh, uh, approval of. I mean the. Uh, well, I move to ratify the action of the, the action of the board to approve the waiver by, the, the, county waiver by the county administrator to hire somebody without within the. Removing the limitation, I think, is what you said, right? Uh, the prohibition. Removing prohibition. the prohibition. Hire uh, a certain employment. Appointment. Remove the prohibition to hire a certain okay. employment. And I, I, I do note that that I, I think the specific waiver is, is necessarily remains confidential yeah. because it is right. it's, it's, it's sure. confidential as to the employee. Right. Okay, can we have a second to that motion? Second. Ms. Eager. All right, we have a motion by Mr. O'Brien and second by Mrs. Eager. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Chair both side. And was that the last one? Mm -hmm. Oh, too. right, great. Any old now, um, no, any unfinished business, oh, yeah. we get that, yeah. new business, we've done that. Now we're with the second public comments. If we have anyone who would like to speak, please raise your hand if you're online. Uh, anyone in the audience, come to the podium and give your name and address. So anyone would like to speak? I think we have some people, but they oh, have oh, to wait, come oh, off. Just oh, take your time. I think Elizabeth would like Mr. to. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore. Just need to be unmuted. Yeah, she's going to unmute. There you go. 
Jeez. Okay, this Bye. is uh, me, me again, Ron Moore. And you know, there's there's a really um, thing that's been talked about, but not really. I don't I don't know what kind of world some of these people are living in, because um, they're going to build this um, uh, whatever it's called. They take debris in from around the world, uh, not around the world, but a demolition, uh, whatever it's called. And that's going to be down memory lane. And they're talking about tons of trucks coming in every day. Now, this is going to happen now. Y'all have passed everything to make it happen. And then we've got this thing across the street, which is going to have all kinds of people coming in and out all day long on 250. Now, today... There was a, a serious accident right up on um, uh, Zion Road, right where Zion Road comes into 250. And that's just regular traffic, although regular traffic now here is pretty intense. You've got tons of heavy-duty um, debris trucks going in and out of the dump, uh, excuse me, the recycling plant down the road. If VDOT doesn't step up with these developers and figure out a way to make the traffic pattern realistic, you're going to have the biggest bunch of accidents you've ever seen right in this area because we live here and there's accidents all the time. And this is without all of this other traffic that is going to be coming right out of this little area here, right in front of our house, down to memory lane. And um, they better uh, get their act together. There's going to be a lot of injured people down the road. Anyhow, that's just another little comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and, and I, I do. I, I would like. I'm sorry. I would like to mention that that uh, uh, the recycling and so on that he mentioned has, in fact, not been passed. So that's no. still up. It's still coming up, Mr. Moore. Was it Moore? Mr. Moore. That's still coming to in front of the county. Well, I certainly, anyhow, no comment on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more comments so. for the board? Yeah, that, 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 okay. that, uh, yeah. that case will be coming to the board February 15th. Right. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to close the second comments, public comment. Wow. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Do we have a second? Second. All right. Motion to adjourn by Mr. O'Brien. Second by Mr. Fairchild. Thank you all. Thank you. And have a good night. You do. And thank all of you all online. Anyone else is listening? Thank you. This is America. Well, uh, yeah, sure. We're not going to wear